go. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased that we have this opportunity to connect again and to do our, uh, our next series of uh, conversations. And like you were saying uh, in our earlier conversation that it is, and it isn't really an interview, it's more of a conversation and, you know, covering certain topics and, and looking at uh, a broader perspective of how things are and what we have as a navigational capacity to be able mm -hmm. to, to move through this uh, opportunity. So again, my name is Franco and yourself, Duty, and uh, uh, I'm really pleased that we get to, to play and I love the questions and the discussions that we have. Uh, it's not always uh, as deep with other uh, conversations I have. Sometimes Thank they you. are. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm flattered, and uh, uh, there is a reason uh, that uh, I um, I chose you as uh, my first uh, interviewer, because uh, I I watch your your videos and, and, and your teachings, and I really connect to it. And uh, my nature is uh, the kind of uh, a scientist, a researcher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, I have lots of questions and, and I try to take it to the, let's say, more practical nature, which is techno technology, uh, rather than just uh, pure science and basic science, which is mm -hmm. uh, on the anecdotal side of things. And I want to take the practical uh, uh, in, uh, uh, lessons from spiritual teachings and, and uh, incorporate into my life and those in, uh, around me. So I uh, am very grateful for the previous uh, uh, interview uh, discussion, which was, I think, uh, the best, the most practical as for us. Uh, this, we discussed about the entities, mm -hmm. and uh, we discussed about the uh, life cycle of, of, the, of the soul, and we, s we discussed about the uh, say free will, boundaries of the soul. Mm -hmm. um, in this interview discussion, uh, I would like to discuss more about uh, differentiating uh, and being more practical about uh, entities and souls, uh, how we, uh, let's say, uh, relate and create entities, manifest entities, and how we control them, if we can. And uh, also, uh, let's say, um, identifying uh, creation, creatures, which have souls or who don't have souls. Um, okay, so let's, let's begin with this question of, of who has, who possess souls? How do you identify those who possess souls and differentiate from those who don't? Okay. okay. Well, I mean, you were saying in a, a previous conversation that we had that, uh, you know, animals uh, tend to, to have a soul, or at least you felt that uh, your particular pet has a soul. Now, the one thing with animals, um, let's start with animals, and then we can go into, tree, uh, you know, plant life and so forth. With, when it comes to uh, say an animal, um, it doesn't have an individualized soul. It operates within a collective soul of that particular species. So it can create a little channel of specification for that particular animal. So for example, uh, say you have a little dog and mm -hmm. the dog uh, basically at this point in time um, is not having a soul like a human would have completely with past lives and, and uh, with mm -hmm. reoccurring uh, experiences of learning and so forth. It's like humanity is evolving yes. uh, at a soul level and an entity level. Uh, an animal is also has an entity and um, is evolving in that regards. But when it comes to the animal evolution, it is more of a collective. So that means uh, all the dogs or certain because some of them are broken down categories um share one soul in a sense and mm -hmm. they communicating so in essence the species of the animals is also evolving as a soul unit but not individualized mm -hmm. you know one by one now 
in a connection with a human, for example, at times, what occurs, I shouldn't say at times, most of the time, what occurs, if there's a relationship, a connection made, say, with your dog. So you have a dog, you make a strong connection. What happens is it links to your soul and is communicating more directly with your soul. Oh, so, so it's private connection. Yes. And so mm -hmm. its experience becomes part of your experience. So okay. if the animal, the dog, for example, is now playing around and experiencing in your family dynamic, mm -hmm. its viewpoint, its perspective, uh, the how it observes and interacts with you and with other planet, uh, without a, with other people in the, in the family, there's a direct connection. So you may have, say, two children, just as an example. One child not interested in the in the in the dog and pays that there's not that same level of connection it just exists and may play a specific role but it doesn't so you have a say for yourself you have a very strong connection maybe your other child has a strong connection too so mm -hmm. it will create more of an intimate more uh, direct connection so that becomes the dog's experience the dog's observation becomes part of your experience in your soul. So it's actually registered in your soul. So it actually piggybacks onto your soul. Okay. At the same time, it still has a connection to the collective soul of the animal. So the dog's uh, collective soul. Now, there are instances where if a dog comes into your life and your soul is communicating to the the, what you can call the oversoul, the, the, the main soul of the animals, of the dog, for example, mm -hmm. then a specific channel of experience can be transmitted to the dog for your own experience for yourself. Mm -hmm. And at times, that can be, pets are pretty powerful when it comes to that, when it, it, it takes on the assignment to facilitate. So mm -hmm. for example, you need an experience where you are so uptight, so intense, so whatever it is, and you're playing in a certain pattern. Your soul is trying to help you shift it, but your characteristics and your entity is very rigid, mm -hmm. um, or ego mind also, very rigid to, to move. Then uh, the dog comes in and communicates with your soul and says, okay, great, I'm gonna download this particular level of consciousness and experience mm -hmm. to be shared with you uh, with the human, uh, with uh, mm -hmm. the owner, whatever you want to call it, so mm -hmm. that it actually helps you to evolve and to also even break a pattern. Because it I was interesting, some years ago, this goes back maybe over a decade ago, somebody said, well, look, I, I've noticed that a lot of the pets, uh, say for dogs, cats, whatever, mm -hmm. tend to take a certain level of similarity to the human um, owner or the you know the, mm -hmm. the, the the partner it's like the look the the mannerisms and so forth because mm -hmm. they end up being someone of a mirror for mm -hmm. you they also end up playing you know a, a particular role uh, for you and uh, so i looked at that and i go okay that's exactly what's happening and then of course you know i have communicated with uh, animals too mm -hmm. at the soul level and they were you know sent a confirmation or communicated confirmation but that's how it was doing so it's not very you know limited now if you're talking about animals that are just roaming free that have really not a strong connection mm -hmm. to humans uh, because there's not a, a relationship established then mm -hmm. they're just operating within their soul so if you get a lion or you get a, an elephant they they each have different cluster uh, soul that they use they're all mm -hmm. communicating with that uh, that particular experience so the one particular animal as it learns and as it becomes more evolved in uh, from a soul perspective it communicated with uh, that that hub it's like your server like if you load everything up on your server mm -hmm. yeah. say from somebody's yeah. separate pc uh that data that whatever you've uploaded now is everybody that's on the network has access to it, right? So uh, that's how it works with, uh, with the animal kingdom. This applies to the, uh, the plant life, to the mm -hmm. insect world. Now the insect world has a, a little less, it's much lower. Uh, mm -hmm. Birds the same way. I mean, there's different, you know, 
reptilian type uh, animals and so forth. Mm -hmm. They all work in, in that way. When you really look at it, the, uh, it's still part of the collective entity in a way. It has a connection to that. It's not operating directly that way. And it's also from the, the collective oversoul. So basically, the souls on the planet are still intercommunicating with the animal kingdom and so forth. So it's amazing how it works. So it, it takes a while to explain it in all the levels that it functions, but it's amazing how that, that exists. Hopefully, I've answered what you were inquiring about that. Well, some of it. Um, so is there also a benefit? to the pets inside of the humans do they get also oh absolutely absolutely because there is a we are all one okay, okay. Um, and the advancement of humanity advancement of the animal is all beneficial so the animal wants to assist for example for humanities or what we call the collective evolution with the collective experience and evolution of the human is also being reflected in the animal. Let's put it this way. If you look at animals, even the food chain or the aggressor uh, modalities that some wilder mm -hmm. animals will take and so forth is very powerfully a reflection to the human experience Whoa. on their operating system. Because okay. if humanity starts to calm down, and not operating in that frequency, you'll notice that the, the, the whole thing changes with even the interaction with the animals and sex, you name it, the oceanic, uh, oceanic animals and so forth, uh, species. So all of it actually uh, changes. So you see that everything is reflecting back and forth. Uh, for example, like if you take a dog. Yes. A dog may be trained and programmed to be very aggressive as a protector or guard dog. Mm -hmm. Yes. It will play that. However, if that dog meets up with somebody that's vibrating a very peaceful nature, mm -hmm. as much as the dog is programmed as, you know, as a guard dog and would be in an attack mode, mm -hmm. it will not attack and would actually be very calm with that interaction with that person, even so though their little... job is to be yeah. an aggressor. So it's a reflection. Correct. And, but it's also not only a reflection, it's also um, there's a communication of what services are required. For example, if somebody's mm -hmm. going in that's very fearful of dogs or fearful of any aggression, mm -hmm. then they're kind of opening up that channel of frequency. So the dog kind of gets the message and says, oh, I would be best serving you uh, to be an aggressor at this moment. But somebody coming in that doesn't require that, the dog kind of gets the message, not necessary here. You're not of service here in that way. Mm -hmm. so be, and I've seen, I, I've seen this what happened, and I've, I'm sure you have observed, observed this yourself. If you have ever seen that some dogs can be very um, aggressive uh, with certain people and mm -hmm. then not aggressive with others. So mm -hmm. somebody's walking down the street and they see a dog and then and they're just petting them and then normally they're pretty aggressive. And then they walk in a way and somebody else comes by and they're barking at them and you know uh, reacting very uh, mm -hmm. negative. Yeah. It's because, yes, part of it is a mirroring, but part of it is how it serves in regards of what one's reflecting versus the other. And so the other one goes, oh, okay, that's it. Now, so that is totally, uh, is strongly connected. And of course, the animal kingdom wants to also upgrade too, along with the human. But the human is kind of the leader in a way. Now, saying that, there's another thing that's going on. And that is some of the animals have chosen to actually start to reflect the smaller group of souls that are on the planet that are uh, more and more uh, connective and are feeling more oneness. I don't know if you've paid attention or noticed, but you'll notice that you can get two types of animals that actually are considered in the operating system as enemies. Like you say, um, a particular animal that would eat another type of animal or would, would attack it in a sense. Mm -hmm. You're starting to notice that there's a different relationship being established where they're not playing the role of 
attack and one becomes the food chain or something mm -hmm. of that nature. So you're seeing, yeah. you know, what would be not conducive as a cat and a dog or, you know, other animals uh, that would be, uh, you know, considered a uh, predator mm -hmm. and so forth. You'll notice mm -hmm. that there's more relationships of that being established in a very loving and so forth, where you wouldn't expect it before. Especially one for, for, the, for, the, for the young ones. Let's say I, I saw um, a, a dog uh, chasing a cat, but he is very uh, loving to, uh, to the kittens that were grown uh, next to him. And, mm -hmm. and they are his kind of his favorite cats on the other one hand. Yeah. And the other hand, I saw a cat um, that's very protective of, uh, of uh, 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 chicken chicks. Hmm. That was uh, brought uh, next to him, and it was kind of it, they, they almost hatched next to to the to the cat. Yes, and, and the cat take over and, and protect the, the chicks, small chicks. Yeah, correct, exactly. Yeah. The the muttering instinct comes in, but also yes. the the other part of it, where it's just the the next. Oh, we got to protect the young. But you'll also notice it with uh, grown-up animals too. At times, uh, mm -hmm. also being the case where they're not going to, you know, uh, be the the typical aggressor, being aggressive, whatever you want to call it, uh, versus you know the one being more passive. You find that it's very calming, and and I've seen this before because on many cases, and I think people have mm -hmm. even posted that on videos where they see, you know. Two animals that would rather not, you know, be friends, becoming really <laughs> close and friendship, and mm -hmm. and also wanting not to to part. I have a friend, um, a lady that I know that I have worked with. Uh, she raises, uh, she uh, uses horses to mm -hmm. create therapy for other humans, and the relationship that they have, the the wisdom and the communication they have is amazing. Um, Mm -hmm. of how that is there and that's just one example and mm -hmm. uh, for example I know another lady that I've worked with and she is a therapist and uh, she has clients that goes in and she does Reiki and a few other th therapies her dog comes in the room where she's doing the therapy all the time and they're communicating and helping each other while they're working on a client uh, it's amazing because uh, she was telling me this so, a little while ago. She goes, "Well, when my dog's in there, I'm actually much more intuitive, and it and the things that I don't see, the dog will relate to her uh, what she sees, so that she can be more effective in working with the client." So it's just amazing how all of that is yes. evolving. Cats, cats also. Yes, yes. <laughs> and what's interesting about cats and dogs too, they see a lot of things that humans don't see. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and I've probably have noticed because if say an entity comes in the room or something, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a lower energy, they usually either they go on guard or they may uh, bark or, or snarl at them or they run away, you know, and they go hide or something mm -hmm. of that nature. So also, you also, yes, also babies. Yes, yes, babies, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. My say my granddaughter. My granddaughter sees things quite amazingly, um, and. Uh, I remember some uh, a year or so ago, she was only not even a year old yet. And we went into this house, which where my, my father used to live. And I know that there's always entities in there. I'm always clearing it out. That my father had passed away and we, we needed to clean up the house and, and uh, dispose of it. Um, so my, my daughter came over to visit uh, quickly to kind of give us a hand and kind of check things over. And she brought her, my granddaughter along. Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter was in her arms. And uh, mm -hmm. as soon as she came into the room, like her eyes opened up and she was looking around and she started to scream like crazy. And no way you could pacify her. There was no way we had to take her outside. Mm -hmm. Because, and then I looked around and go, oh, she can see this. She can see that. So I cleared it all up. But... At the same time, it's amazing what kids can see, like you said, like the animals and, and, and things. Babies. Regular humans have actually filtered out and said, well, I don't want to see that and, and kind of mm -hmm. tune that. And this is more common too with kids now. Yes. I noticed that uh, when I interact with, uh, with babies, 
and uh, babies that they don't walk yet, mm -hmm. and I carry them, they don't look at my face. They look at my aura. Right. They are fascinated by, with my aura. I don't know with other people, but I notice that they are amazed by my, my I don't know it's my personal aura, but it fascinates them. Yes, so yes. Look all around me. Not at me. Yes. I, you know, the thing is, too, if you pay attention to the aura, when when you're holding a child that's carrying a certain frequency and so forth, uh, your aura shifts and it moves because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I've observed it. So you, you see, say you had purple coming off the top and then all of a sudden it goes like this, it expands and moves around and other colors move around. Mm -hmm. So that actually becomes quite a kaleidoscope of entertainment for the child looking at it and saying, like, oh, this is interesting how I could see it move. And then it, the child starts, and so many children, uh, when they're young too, get to realize by certain emotions that they feel or whatever, it changes your aura too mm -hmm. because it's interconnected. So to them, it's mm -hmm. almost like, oh, I can control right. that. You become a toy because you can control the the way the the colors move and so forth. So it's yes, that's what there's a lot of them are seeing. Okay, um, so we explored the the the, the animal kingdom. Let's go far, far, uh, uh, further to the uh, plant kingdom. Mm -hmm. Do, do uh, plants have uh, 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 souls and, and let's say uh, uh, creation, created entities? Yes, um, again, it's not individualized. It's more of a collective. Um, so per species? By, based on species, yes. Yes. Now, some species have, they share the same one because they're very close in the family energy frequency of, this, of the species of plants. So you're not going to have every individual plant having a different one. Uh, and it has its own entity too. Again, it's a collective entity. So I don't know if you ever paid attention, but... Um, did you ever communicate with plants? Like have a talk with them, even just, you, maybe you may not hear them or may not get an input from them as, as clearly. But if you talk to the plant, you'll see that the plant actually responds. I, I did not uh, uh, talk to, uh, to, uh, uh, to plants, but I hug trees. <laughs> okay. And, and, and uh, I bless my food. Beautiful. With mostly Beautiful. vegetables. Yes. I'm a vegetarian, okay. Yes. Most, my, my, I'm mostly vegetarian, so I bless, I bless the food, and I um, try to, uh, let's say, to increase its its uh, energetic value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, or so, yeah. So plant life. Uh, the other thing about plant life is that each of the plants carry a certain frequency that is supportive on a collective scale. Mm -hmm. um, it is not affected so much by the human's frequency. Uh, in, in when I say that, more it's, it reflects it to a certain degree. It's only a small percentage. It's like I think it's like 20%. It might be a little more. Than, uh, I might be off by my memory here. Mm -hmm. But about, it reflects about 20% of the collective energy of the planet. But a lot of the, the majority of the energy that the, um, the frequency that the plant transmits is the mm -hmm. collective plant life but also from a from the species that it's from because a lot of the species of the plants that are on the planet are coming from another planet and they were okay. brought in and then hybridized a little bit to be able to um, support mm -hmm. human when you walk through the forest for example or wherever there's lots of plant life most people feel very comfortable there mm -hmm. me too yes the reason that is, is because they hold a certain energy and they're transmitting that energy. They're also communicating with plant. Now, for example, if you go and meditate in nature, the connection is not, it's much stronger, but it's also communicating with you. So the plant will share its observation, the planet's observation, the air's observation, the water, whatever it is connected to, because it is connected to all of that. And, and it reflects more of that higher aspect of yourself in a way uh, when you're when you're doing that i found mm -hmm. i do the same thing i do hug trees at times i i love to meditate with my back against the tree because in mm -hmm. essence i can feel it's very grounding energy too 
Now, I always ask permission for a tree before I hug it. The reason is because a lot of my frequency is quite different. It's a somewhat alien in a way. Mm -hmm. But so I just ask, I say, okay, can I connect with you? And there's times the trees would say, uh, I'm not, no, I'm holding a certain energy that you would, uh, you know, throw off at this point. Other times, it says, yes, great. Mm -hmm. So I hug the energy, I hug the tree, and I can feel, and there's a communication back and forth. And, I, of course, I share my appreciation for its, its presence and uh, the energy it holds on the planet, it holds for all of us and, and so forth. And it also uh, relates. There's, there's many times I've been told by plant life that, uh, you know, there's certain things happening that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, so I, I can do that sometimes energetically. Other times I just up, bring it up into the collective so that somebody else, or a group of people will go in and, and make some changes mm -hmm. accordingly. For example, I was near a stream at one point and I was giving the tree a hug and the tree kept saying, there's a lot, there's very uh, strong pollution coming through the lake, right? That particular mm -hmm. stream, for example. And uh, so I said, okay, uh, can you direct me where it's coming from? It couldn't tell me exactly, but it was coming from upstream. So I walked upstream. And uh, while I was walking upstream, I noticed that somebody had dumped a container, like it was a huge container uh, mm -hmm. with many liters of chemicals. And it had been dumped there for a long time. And I, I, what happened is it started to leak. Oh. Right? Now, mm -hmm. a good portion of it had leaked out, probably more than half. But it wasn't leaking originally, but somehow with the environment being exposed to it, it started to leak, and I noticed it. So what I did is I lifted the container so it wasn't spilling, dripping this down the, um, the stream. Mm -hmm. And I did contact the municipality at that point saying that there was this container, it was leaking, I noticed mm -hmm. it, and I, I flipped it up. Can you send somebody to go and remove it? So they did, they, I, I imagine they did because sometime later I went by, it wasn't there. But um, so that was, that was communicated by the tree. I was not aware of it. And I wasn't actually intending to walk up the stream either. Uh, but I was, going to, I was going through a path, but the stream, mm -hmm. I actually got off the path and went along the stream to see what the tree had told me. And because the tree's roots were deep enough, the water from the stream was actually seeping into the soil and the, and the tree was picking that up. So it's amazing, uh, you know, what level of communication. I'm just giving you an example. This is what mm -hmm. happened a few years ago. And, uh, and I found that, oh, okay, great. You know, they're, they're, it gives you notification of uh, things that are occurring. Now, I know that plants have communicated i've and i'm sure other people have communicated i'm not isolated by that that uh, capacity but have found that um it feels the energy of what we're going through uh but it also feels the energies of the stuff that's being dumped in the air water and so forth and it, it mm -hmm. does share for us to kind of a wisdom pay attention because this affects you too you know uh, kind of that's the message I've kind of seen and received over over the years, but I've, others have I've done I've uh, received similar message. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, now if we're taking to um, uh, uh, rocks and uh, soil and things like that, I, and I'm sure I don't know if you've had the experience personally yourself where you've been drawn to a rock, for example, and you picked it up and. You can connect with it. It has a wisdom to it. It communicates no, with you. I never. No. no, but many people collect rocks because of that. It's, mm -hmm. There's a connection, right? Yes, my daughter did. No, one of them. She liked, she even, these days, she likes to pick rocks. Yes, because they hold a certain energy, first of all. Second of all, it uh, reflects an energy that they want to access themselves. So it, it actually pro mm -hmm. provides not, somewhat of a grounding too. If you hold it, you can communi communicate and it can share certain experiences for you. So all the various elements do talk to us. The wind talks to us. The, the rain mm -hmm. talks to us. I mean, we have connection to all of it, you know, and it's interesting. For example, the oceanic uh, life too. For people, we find mm -hmm. that uh, there's a connection with... Um, Dolphins. With dolphins, for example, yes. Whales, uh, you know, other mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, you know, life that's in, in, in the ocean and so forth, mm -hmm. because it's all that. If you go in the water, I don't know if you've experienced it yourself. Like if you go in the ocean or if you go into the lake and you're swimming, this, it's like you're entering a pool of energy. You can feel it all around you. And feel, it almost yes. embraces you. It feels like it's yes. hugging you. I feel, I feel uh, enhanced connection with Gaia when I'm in water, in bath or, or in the sea. Yes, yes. And I found that too because actually I, I, somebody had shared this to me. I, it wasn't my, my own realization. Uh, I went to see a person that, you know, we communicate uh, on a spiritual level at times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, I feel so much better when, um, when I'm in this, the ocean because I love the seawater. There's something about it. And it helps me actually clean out some of the denser energies that, you know, I collect from walking mm -hmm. around and playing with the world and, and even my own emotional stuff that comes up at times. And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She says, you know what's the best thing? She says, fill your bathtub with water and pour sea salt. Get the purest form that has not been, you know, iodinized or processed. You know, get yes. the ones that evaporate it. And she says, when you're in the bath, go right in it and then talk to the element of the salt. Talk to the element of the water to kind of cleanse you and so forth. So I've tried that. And it works quite amazingly. And it's like, oh, wow, it's pretty darn close to, you know, swimming in the, in the ocean type of thing or being mm -hmm. in that water. So it's, um, yeah, all, all of it is there to sustain and support us. And there's all of that um, in its existence. And there, it carries a consciousness. It carries a consciousness. So, so let's distinguish with a consciousness and, and a soul. If I, I, um, I hold to the idea that uh, every uh, uh, creation, Every, every cell and every, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, no, part, particle of, se of sand, okay, mm -hmm. has some conscious. Correct. B but what is the difference between a so soul and a conscious? Because soul is not a conscious. Right? So that's the no, difference. They, they kind of work together, but they're not. They're separate because the consciousness itself is the conscious. It's basically it's operating system. It's it's awareness. It's uh, the information that it gains through the experience. So that's what consciousness is. And in our consciousness, of course, you know, even when we talk about shifting from a third to a fourth to a fifth dimensional consciousness, it's just reaching. Uh, further access to awareness to and what happens is the higher consciousness that you go you have further awareness from because lower consciousness limits the awareness to existence like for example somebody in a th third dimensional consciousness that is totally ingrained in that and and that's hard that's not hard to find but the, you know that is not as prevalent as we think it is uh, because we all have different levels of consciousness, would relate with a third dimensional consciousness as just being a physicality and its own existence and its own mind thought, and that's it. When you're going into fourth and fifth dimensional consciousness, there's a higher awareness of more of your essence. That is the consciousness. So you're bringing in consciousness is more information, more sensorial um, accessibility, and more awareness of what you can do. The soul itself is a is in a in a way it's the is source itself in its purest form that is localized itself with a signature but is a recorder of experiences of information from all levels. For example, uh, your particular soul, our particular soul, human soul, mm -hmm. is recording every aspect of the experience from every level of sensorial, but also also its awareness of. So it uses consciousness to uh, create its reality and learn from its reality, expand its its awareness or uh, what we call its uh, enlightenment access uh, because uh, through it. So the soul itself is that part of sourceness, which is the creation mm -hmm. of all existence, that is recording uh, the individualized. And then, of course, it goes into different levels of um, soul connection, right back to source connection. So source mm -hmm. expands and learns and grows uh, through, through that because source is not stagnant, as we are not stagnant. Mm -hmm. So if, if we relate to source as a, let's say, a collector or recorder, 
of experience, which different level of conscious. So there could be a soul, let's say to a stream, uh, I mean, a, a river stream, okay, a, a water stream. There could be a, a conscious, let's say to a, a rock or let's say to a mountain, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Right? Yeah. So there should be, beside of being a mountain which, with a conscious of a mountain, mm -hmm. And there is something, some kind of a recording of the experience of that mountain. Correct. And it was created and, and it's, let's say, whatever is, is happening to the, to the mountain, a few erosion, interaction with wildlife and so forth. Correct, correct. Right. So the, the difference is that, uh, like you said, um, is re all of it has uh, a soul recorder, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is, and that's why I was saying with the animals and, and uh, other elementals, that it doesn't have a very specific individual. So if you're talking about the mountain, the mountain in that area is referring, is, is being recorded to everything that's going on from that mountain, all the mountains in the area, mm -hmm. which then is the next level is all the mountains in a bigger span of area. And then of course, the whole, all the mountains on the planet, for example. So mm -hmm. those are all, uh, but you're not gonna have mountain A having one individualized recorder for that mountain A, because there's, very, there's much less ch change that's occurring. The only reason that humans have individualized, because they are here to have individualized, because all of us are experiencing it uh, much more um, uh, fluid, for example. Mm -hmm. So that we are uh, much more active in our experience and our, the way our consciousness shifts or the way we uh, operate uh, greatly changes us each moment uh, once we're, we're on that fast track. So you can see that where you're going to find that uh, things like mountains and other uh, elementals, even including animals, uh, don't evolve as quickly because they're, they're not to do that. That's not specific to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, non-incarnated uh, uh, elements uh, that we have in our experience? Let's say, uh, sometime a uh, uh, ghost and uh, deities and, uh, and demons and edge and so forth. How can we, uh, let's say, distinguish those with souls and those without souls? Is it important at all? Well, in a way, it's not uh, important. Uh, however, um, let's put it this way. The reason a, a soul would become part of the experience if there is something being advanced by it. So for example, an entity. You take an entity, what's an entity? An entity can come from a human entity, it can be from, a, from a, an animal entity. For example, say a cat dies and it was close to your mm -hmm. family. Some people will see the cat's entity around, even though the, it's not in physical form anymore, but they would be able to see it or see this movement or be able to maintain a certain com communication because there's a purpose behind the fact of that entity being around. So the cat's yes. entity still exists. Yes. Same thing with the humans. Now, when we're talking about demons and all those other things, those entities can come from various places. They can be entities that have agreed upon uh, or been assigned upon to be able to play a very dark role. So they may have been in, they will have been in a human form at some point, or they may be in an alien form. I, I wish to interrupt you. I want to, uh, to set the lightings because the daylight is coming off. Okay. So I want to, to, take, to put on the light. Sure. Okay. So thanks for adjusting the lighting. Um, yeah, so in, in essence, and it's, it's every time I stop, I always kind of lose my thought there. Uh, okay, we, we spoke about entities and, right. and, uh, and their, their relationship to, uh, to, uh, to conscious, uh, let's say, souls. Yes, okay. yes, okay. So with the entities itself, um, like we were saying about the cat's entity may show up or, or mm -hmm. whatever if the, if the cat left. Now, mm -hmm. The same thing applies to humans. Now, so the entities that are around either may have had a human experience before or may be coming from an alien experience and so forth, where mm -hmm. that entity still sticks around. Now, what determines if it sticks around or not, if the entity feels that it didn't want to part and still the collective entity 
is saying, yeah, okay, you can stay because, you know, uh, we can all advance from, from, from this, your, your presence being there. Now, so the entities will be around uh, on different realms. And, and in this case, it does take planet mm -hmm. Earth. So there'll be a go. And, you know, a lot of the entities people talk about, you know, they call about entities. Other people will call it ghosts or call it whatever because it's just a, it's just a label that they've given. Mm -hmm. But it's one and the same thing. You're not going to really have a soul because a soul will communicate and a lot of times it does not create a form unless it's, you know, going to utilize some form of entity. But so a lot of times, like, where people talk about you know there's entities that you can communicate with because it's from somebody you recognize or it's coming from an entity from a, mm -hmm. a, a more advanced species of uh, from an, an alien because mm -hmm. a lot of times people say well you know I channel or I connect a lot of times what they're doing is connecting to entities entities from from a different experience so say I'm going to connect with uh, an entity in um, uh, from from a Pleiadian uh, incarnational uh, pool of energy and, mm -hmm. and also consciousness. So now you're going to have that level of communication and transmission. So a lot of times these entities also show up on the planet. You know, they'll present. The same thing with the hum uh, the other entities where we say, okay, well, we have a demon entity or dark entity. That, again, that's a, la um, a label. But... Mm -hmm they will play a very dark role because their frequency is tuned for that because of their experience, but also because the area that is, they, they, they hang around is supportive of that energy. So if you have a group of people that um, are very fear-based and very low energy, so you, mm -hmm. this happens also going to bars, you know, certain bars and certain, where they go and drink and whatever else, or, uh, or because, Alcohol actually lowers your frequency. Uh, okay. People don't, don't like to admit that, but it does. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain freedom at first because it lowers your inhibition of your own you know, filters because it numbs it a little bit. But what mm -hmm. happens is your frequency lowers. So if you have a, a group, especially if you're going into a place where people tend to drink a lot and get very uh, low frequency and then get into arguments or get into very low state, entities that are of a lower vibration kind of hover there and at times they will attach to people and some people can carry two or three or more uh, entities that attach to them the only reason they can attach is because they're already in that low frequency but what happens there's a there's a, a, a challenge that occurs is if once they're attached they tend to kind of want to navigate to keep you in that low frequency. So say you, you, you were drinking and your, low, your frequency lowered or you were mm -hmm. having a very powerful emotional state and your frequency lowered. This particular entity attaches to you. Uh, now it tries to navigate to some degree so that you stay in that low frequency so that it can actually mm -hmm. feel at home. It, it, it keeps their vibration going. So that, that can participate. And this is where people are going in and clearing entities on people and whatever else because they've mm -hmm. attached and then it keeps them allure. Can it go the other ways? Let's say uh, you can get attachment to, uh, let's say, high, uh, entities with higher vibration that will, be, will keep you up? Yes. If you're having a very elated experience where you're feeling really, really good, then mm -hmm. the, the higher vibrational entities will, will be around and they will attach. Now, their attachment is a little different. Their attachment is not to feed off you. Their attachment is to contribute. So in essence, they're not going mm -hmm. to um, harvest your energy of a lower frequency saying, okay, I need to recharge, I need to be here, or else I change. Mm -hmm. Let me explain one thing. And uh, uh, I know it's a little bit off topic, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Trying to find a wording for it now. Okay. Darker entities or lower frequency entities, they're kind of experience the fact that we are evolving and the energies of the planet itself is raising. Okay. So the planet, the all of Gaia and all its elementals uh, are raising in its vibration. And there are more people raising in vibration. So the, the energies in the field of where 
uh, it dwells in, the energy is a high. So in essence, it goes to places where there's pockets of lower frequency. For example, like I give you the example of bars. Makes sense. Because it's not very comfortable. So when that entity attaches to this individual that is of a lower energy, it will do its best to keep the energy low because it will be able to stay within a range of frequency. Mm -hmm. If it detaches from that and it doesn't quickly find another donor or another mm -hmm. uh, partner. Host. Host. Is, yes, host. host. Thank you. That's good. That's the word mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out. Another host. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's exposed to the elementals and all the energies there, guess what happens? It, it can't flourish and it starts to it starts to disintegrate in a sense, or, or in this case, mm -hmm. lose its 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 range and it starts to expand. Where the opposite works, that is, a higher vibration entity become looks is not looking for a host, but it looks for a partner to play with. Mm. So it will attach to be able to maintain that higher frequency, not because it thrives off it, mm -hmm. because by assisting that individual to stay in that higher frequency, mm -hmm. it will allow for, for them to actually access higher consciousness, be able to create a, a, their own pattern of energy shifts. So, so example, say somebody is very negative most of the time, and then they have an experience that raises their vibration to be more positive, for example, or more mm -hmm. neutral, yes. then uh, for many people, that's temporary. So they have something that, so an entity will come in and connect with that and continue to creating a pattern of staying in that positive or neutral state, mm -hmm. which what happens is it rewrites the operating system of the individual and also the frequencies of the, of the body itself, it starts to raise it so that it would not be able to go back down to the same level. So it's actually contributing to raise the vibration and create a new pattern. So for example, mm -hmm. back to the example of what I was saying, so if somebody has been very negative but they started to have some elated uh, experiences, which is more positive, for example, then mm -hmm the entity is assisting them to have more positive, they have a tendency to feel more comfortable in the positive and they start to play more in the positive and they will have less tendency to want to go into the negative as before. And then, of course, on a collective scale, they, they become much more uh, in alignment with the energies of the planet and where the, you know, the, the direction that we are going on a collective scale. So, in essence, uh, a soul is let's say, a kind of an entity. Yes, yes, yes. And so, it's, it's and if I understand correctly, the soul actually is a, a recorder. Correct. Or a collector of experience. Correct. While other entities are not really engaged in, in collecting or recording the experience, they're just in there to service or, or to uh, service themselves or service others. Yes, I mean, and, and when it does that, of course, it as it serves others, it serves other other people that have souls that have recorders, so it advances there. So it's all interconnected, right? Okay, so so um, let's talk about sovereignty. Is there any sovereignty with when you said okay, there are let's say entities that uh, can uh, assist us to pull up or lower us down. Where's the, the soul or sovereignty of the person, if there is any sovereignty of, of picking or choosing or attaching or disattaching from, from those entities? Well, the soul that you have in the body um, plays a role. Your own personal entity plays a role. Your innate consciousness plays a role. So all of it is kind of participating. However, if there's a pattern of negative darkness or whatever you want to call it with the individual, then what happens is, yes, you're going to have attachments to the negative entities coming along, which will accentuate negativity, will accentuate more of that lower state. And what it does is creates a saturation point. 
allowing its personal entity, its ego mind, its uh, innate consciousness, and also the soul to record and to actually immerse itself in that negativity to the mm -hmm. point it says, okay, we don't need this any longer. And then it can start activating the other part of it where the other, it can tap into other resources. A lot of it is unconscious. A lot of it we don't know exactly what's occurring. Mm -hmm. However, should we, mm -hmm. should we should we be conscious about uh, let's say uh, our let's say uh, environment of entities and pick okay I want to get attached or disattached to that one? Yes, absolutely. As you become more uh, observant, as you become more. Um, how can I say, conscious of what's going on in your surroundings, you will be able to notice uh, any, first of all, the energies around you, the interactions mm -hmm. that you have, and also the entities in, within yourself, but also the different parts of you that are communicating. And that becomes very instrumental in becoming more powerful in your navigation with all of it together. This is the thing is that people have a tendency to be programmed to a point where they operate unconsciously. But as you become more aware and you become more conscious, you see all of that. You can feel that. Even if you don't see it, you can feel it. You can, you can walk into a room and you can sense where somebody's at in their energy or what the energy in the room is. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure with yourself too, if, uh, if your daughter is having a bad day or your partner is having a bad day, mm -hmm. they don't have to say a single word. You don't even have to see them. You can feel them in the next room. Yes. You know, something's going on, right? Yes. That's, that's the part that's observing. Now, if an entity is coming along, you can feel them attached to you because in essence, you're going to have the same intuitiveness, the same feel of that energy there and you go, oh, what's it here? What's that? Or if they even enter the room, you know, and they're mm -hmm. coming into the room and they're hanging around there. Now, as you become that observant, you can walk into a room and say there's four people in the room and they're having a negative discussion. But you can walk in the room and you can feel the energy's thick. But if you sense the rest of the room, you're going to feel that there's, wow, the energy is like all over the place. It's not just localized in the group that's in the corner of that room having this negative. Because what's happening is you're going to sense all these other negative entities in the room that are there. Mm -hmm. And that's how you become. And then you can choose to turn all that, you know, just basically clear out the room. Or you can just make sure that they don't, you know, participate with you by keeping your vibration. So, okay. yes, it's beneficial to be conscious of it and aware. Okay. So, if we are conscious about um, entities... Uh, we didn't speak about possession, we'll speak later about possessions, but uh, if we speak about entities, um, it's, uh, there's a danger of taking the, um, uh, uh, the uh, aspect of, of victim. Oh. Okay, this attached me, that attached to me, I'm not in control, uh, I have bad mood because this, I, I'm sick, and tired because let's say uh, I've got an entity and so forth and so forth. So I go to a healer. The healer will will uh, detach those entities and and I'm good for till till next appointment. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, what about let's say again the issue of sovereignty? How we uh, enable or empower a people? To take to take responsibility for what they feel, what they experience whether it is with uh, related to entities or with their own, let's say, innate entity or uh, personality or whatever, which is the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the thing, the thing too with entities, when we're, we're talking about that, um, we have sovereignty over ourselves and how we navigate through it. Now, if we are, like for example, that you gave, Somebody uh, goes in, has entities attached to them, go to a practitioner or to a healer, whatever you want to call it. They clean it all out. But if we don't get into the, the basic victim operating system, then we are attracting, if you want to call it that, we're opening up the channel to have 
others step in and to control us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because the fact that we feel we're powerless. This is where the opening comes in. And so, so if we feel powerless. Yes, we are programmed to be powerless. Yes, programmed to be powerless because it's not uh, our true essence. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to emanate that energy. And it's almost like a, it's an invitation, basically. I'm, I'm, I'm powerless. I need something with power to come in. And then that's when the entity goes, oh, okay, I'll come in and I'll play that, that, that power for you. Mm -hmm. So the main thing is to observe. See, so this is what I say to practitioners too. And I say to people, we need to look at, if you're coming in with attached entities, for example, we need to look at why. Okay. What invited them? What program are we and what frequency we are dwelling in. And so if there's a pattern of, yes, I get inebriated heavily all the time because I can't stand life. And when I'm drunk, I don't feel bad or as bad until mm -hmm. afterwards I recover, you know, get sober or whatever you want to call it. So if there's that, or is that they are always negative in their environment and whatever they, you know, the day-to-day the -day stuff, or they feel like total victim. It's like, oh, life is horrible and everybody's out there to hurt me or anything of that nature we need to look at that we need to look at the basic pattern and program that is lowering your frequency to allow, allow the victimizers to come in entity or otherwise right so we need to look at that because then you don't have to keep going back to the practitioner because you, when you're not in that range you're not going to have all these entities mm -hmm. attaching to you you know so so it's it's emotional it's actually an emotional uh, uh, therapy more than uh, practical uh, uh, attachment or healing. Um, the, the healing or let's say the evolution uh, is, is uh, being done on the emotional uh, programming mm -hmm. of uh, perceiving the reality. The, the I look at myself. I was very, very uh, critical. And sometimes Till is a very critical person all around me. And uh, I think I improved, but I have, I have steps to improve more. <laughs> but uh, I see that um, releasing the criticality was part of anticipating bad luck. Mm, yes. Okay? Yes. So, so if I'm very pessimistic, I'm well. I'm not. I'm less prone to let's say yeah, bad uh, uh, surprises. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, but I I think that with assistance from my, for, from my teachers and others and, and practitioners, I learned how to uh, to look for the positive side of things. And to accept that whatever is happening, is not polarized. It just happening, right? But this is this is. I would say this, this teaching needs to be accompanied with experience, with positive experience that will um, enforce this program. Right. Right. Exactly. And it's repetitive uh, programming, unlike let's say in a computer program. I write the code. Okay, it works. Dang. Okay with me, with myself and other humans like me, it's repetitive workout to replace the programs. Mm -hmm. yes. So, so, and my, my, I would say, yeah, uh, my personal duties, uh, perspective of, uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sp spiritual evolution, uh, is uh, creating more self-awareness and self-reflection of what I feel and how I react. Mm -hmm. Okay? And not fighting uh, the victimhood aspect, yes. but rather replacing it. Correct. Excellent. Excellent. And, but this is I would, I would say it's work in progress. <laughs> okay. Um, and I would like the viewers of, of this, uh, 
of of this uh, um, I, I let's say I invite viewers of of this video to uh, look at their life not as a victim but as the creator and if we look at it as a creator okay we have the power to change it and we have the power to uh, uh, look at it as the positive side of okay we created this this negative uh, uh, interaction or whatever reality we had okay maybe we can grow from it to another different and more positive uh, and more suitable I would say positive because positive is is on duality let's say yeah. more suitable and more let's say uh, um, teaching or rewarding experience okay yes uh, as so, so let's take this this approach that i i i grow, I grow for myself grew for myself uh to the uh rela relationship that humans has with entities and non-incarnative beings okay because people tend to look at themselves as victims mm -hmm. oh i've got possessed or i got this entity i need to be clear up okay it's not me it's an entity that's got me let's say upset or let's say uh, uh arrogant or uh, i would say uh, uh, abusive okay mm -hmm. it's not me it's my hand <laughs> okay <laughs> i didn't hit you it's my hand that hit you that's correct. Great analogy. Great. Well, it's it's like anything. Uh, the everything that exists that we've plugged in in our reality on a collective scale, individual scale, on all the different mm -hmm. realms and levels and so forth, all play a role. All of it is to facilitate advancement and further awareness consciousness and enlightenment so even the dance because this this is a, an interesting conversation i had with um with my guide uh, years ago mm -hmm. um and because i was aware of it but i you know it, it's always great to have a, another reflection mm -hmm. and my guide of course that i'm talking about is in non-form uh it's not in form uh, so it doesn't have a physicality, but will you know was presenting mm -hmm. with me at the time, and one of the things in the conversation, I go, you know, I always observe that everything serves for one purpose or another, and the one thing, and I say I will say he because he was presenting in a male physicality, even though it was you know uh, sort of a silhouette type of thing. The one thing he had said to me is that don't ever think that there's anything in existence that in one way or another is not supporting us even in the most polarized and what you guys can call negative or evil or anything of that nature mm -hmm. those are all definitions of course he says nothing exists if it's not in one way or another serving you or serving the collective Okay. The only reason polarity exists is because we're using it as a way to learn and grow and so forth. It's not an absolute. It's not a requirement to, to, to have us to grow. Mm -hmm. However, this sequence of experiences and creation, we have brought that in. So even the darkest of darkest of entities or pockets of consciousness mm -hmm. will serve and will remain in that polarized state until it no longer is required. One of the things that I was shared also was, because at the time we were looking at all these uh, role players that were playing very negative roles, which still exist, that run the, our, our world, our systems and so mm -hmm. forth. And some you know, have come from either from other dimensions or have come from other planets or from another physical form that have you know, interacted with the human, species and made modifications and so forth he said don't think that just because they've done what they've done that in one way or another it didn't set the stage for growth for you guys i mean don't ever think that there's anything that is a miscreation is a mis 
uh, design in its perfection. This, so, this reminds me of, of my, of my uh, uh, email signature that uh, I am perfectly imperfect and, and you are the reader and you are the viewer, you are also perfectly right. imperfect. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> so the, uh, the one thing that uh, was shared with me at the time, which stuck with me and I've used it for, for many, a uh, few decades now, is that in a way, when I was having more of my human experience, which I still do, uh, there were times that I was doing what a lot of people end up doing. Maybe not to the same intensity and degree, but I had a sense of, let's call it judgment mm -hmm. for people that played negative roles, okay? Mm -hmm. And my judgment was not that they're horrible, whatever, that they shouldn't be doing that. And that's, you know, you're, you're, you're affecting the whole and whatever else. As almost like that was a disease. <laughs> And you wanted to be well, but this was the disease and we have to get rid of the disease, for example. So what my guide had told me, because that, in the same conversation that I just finished explaining to you, he said, the only reason they're there and the only reason they're playing the role is to facilitate. However, there are also mm -hmm. consciousness, there are also soul, and there are also me as you, as source, as everything that it is. Mm -hmm. they want to relinquish that role as soon as possible once we no longer need their services. So someone that is very negative or someone that is so-called the victimizer and controlling our planet to stay in the victim state, to stay in the fear state and so forth, once we no longer need that, they will retire. I'm done. See you later. Don't need to do this anymore. They're just waiting. They're playing the role. And one thing that my guide has said to me very powerfully, and that stuck with me too, it is very hard to play a negative role. Really? It's a, it takes a lot. He says only a specific soul and entity can actually take that on. And they have to actually volunteer and be able to be a, such a service to say, okay, this is a hard job. I'm going to go do it. Okay. And don't think that a light worker comes on the planet, what people call light workers, mm -hmm. again, another label, but a light worker comes in and saying they're doing the sacrifice. In fact, there is a certain level of not so called sacrifice, but a, a higher, a certain duty, but coming in with a negative role is even a much stronger duty. And, I, and it shifted my perspective of that. And I thought, well, okay, that totally resonates. That makes total sense that even at the mind level. And mm -hmm. I started to see things very differently. And even my communication with people and entities, because I, I have mm -hmm. done clearing of entities for many decades. And my approach was very different, has been very different for quite a, quite a, quite a long time now is I will have a communication with the entity that's in the space. And I say, okay, why do you feel that you're here? What do you need to do? Well, you know, and then I would say, I always give them the offer. Would you like to be relinquished from that role? And if it says yes, and if it says no, I would ask why. But if it says yes, then I will send them off. I will assist them. I will assist them to actually go through that, you know, that blending and transmuting mm -hmm. uh, aspect of it so it doesn't have to actually stay here. Like I've gone into... And I'm just going to give you one more example and I'll let you uh, navigate okay. further. Uh, I do house cleaning or have been. I haven't done it for quite a while. I still do it, but I don't do it commercially, for example, in a sense where people hire me to go do that. Sometimes I do it for as a favor or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, when you, they, the entities know that you do, they tend to visit you much more often. So our house becomes a clearing house. So I had to create mm -hmm. vortex, uh, what do you call it, the uh, portals outside so that they go there and I direct them there. Mm -hmm. But in essence, when, uh, for example, I lived in an apartment prior to this one, to this house that I'm living now, which I'm moving out again. When I was in the apartment, for example, when I entered there, 
um, there was all these entities all over the place, but a lot of the entities were ones that were kind of caught there and hanging around. So when I moved in the apartment, they were there and I go, okay, what are you guys doing here? And a lot of them were felt that they were caught and they didn't know how to leave. And when I say no. that to a certain degree, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is the only home I know. Yeah, but you don't have a physicality anymore. You don't even have a soul anymore. You're just basically the remaining of this entity that's holding on. And they weren't dark entities per se. Mm -hmm. You know, they were of a, a little bit lower frequency, yes, but they weren't, you know, haunting the 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 place or anything of that nature. Uh, but they were they were there and they were moving around. I could see their shadows and so forth. And my partner would see the shadows and I go, oh, okay. There's all this, so. I, had, I would have a conversation with them. And I, then I would ask them, if I can show you a way to go back and merge with all of it and don't have to be caught here, would you be open to that? And then 99.9% of the time, yes. There would be odd occasions they would say no because they felt that they were um, requested by service. Okay. What do I mean by that? There were people, there are people, say, in the building that, for example, I'll give you one example. I had one entity that was next door that kept coming into my space all the time. And I would ask, okay, do you want to leave? No, I don't, because I'm still needed next door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I, I would ask, I have a conversation. Well, what do you need it for? What do, what's going on there? He says, well, because they're from a lower energy and I'm helping them maintain that lower energy. Plus, it's part of my family because this particular entity was uh, a grandfather that had passed away. Mm -hmm. And they were still hanging around with the family. I said, oh, okay, well, that's what you're doing. I said, but if you're going to come and visit here, I don't want you to participate too much here because that's we don't need you here in your vibration. So stay next door or go, or go wander around some other apartments. And it obliged it. It never showed up again. And... Uh, so that's the, the rare case, occasions. And as rare as it is, there's still a percentage of that that happens. But most, most of them get kind of caught here and don't know how to actually leave. And uh, so you help them home. You help them. That's all you do. Okay. So how can, how can you advise, let's say, the viewer, which do, has no um, ability to sense and, and view uh, entities? Uh, regain its uh, its sovereignty and uh, detach itself from entities that it doesn't like, or wish to clear places. Okay. Um, well, if you're totally not aware of it, except that you're feeling the negative aspect of it, or you're sensing something, then mm -hmm. what I would recommend. I mean, they are open to communicate. Okay. So, in essence, if you drop or even go into a state where you're not afraid of them, mm -hmm. okay, then the communication is more of an evil, ego uh, level field. Mm -hmm. You can communicate with them. You can ask them what they're doing, why they're here, whatever else, and they will come in as thought forms or whatever it is for you. Now, if you choose not to have them and don't want to have the communication, which you're going to have to shift and say, listen, I am in a physical form. I am here with my own entity. I am here to have this experience of this space. And you're not welcome in this space because I am the one. Now, I used to play with that sometimes. I used to say, well, if you're going to the, pay the rent, then you can hang around here. But I'm paying the rent. So in essence, you're not welcome. You know, it's just more of a, a playful. But I, I, it, I, I mean, I, I sincerely did that in a playful way. So you drop the fear part of it or feel that, you know, there's something there, even if it's a negative. If you actually look at it, even if you can't see it, just feel mm -hmm. that part of it and you hold on to your own energy. You say, okay, listen, I'm here. I'm holding the space. Uh, I'd like you guys to leave or I'd like you to leave if it's just one. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, guys, because I am going to occupy the space. But if you're holding negative energies and you're afraid of it, then it's like this. You know what a magnet does? Yes. A magnet. And you're asking this other magnet to come apart. Well, guess what? If you're in fear and they are operating in that frequency, you're stuck. It's like even if they're just in the space, if you're holding the energy in the space. 
So what you have to do is get rid of that polarized negative part of it so that what you're doing is deactivating the negative and then you can allow that to, to leave a lot easier. The same thing with the space, right? Yes. So in essence, what I do is I open up and you all can open up the love that you have and emanate it throughout the house if you're doing the house. Or even if you're dealing with an entity, open up to that. And if it's attached to you, you basically envision in your mind's eye this love that you have opening up in your whole body. It's, it's like somebody turns on the light bulb, and mm -hmm. the light bulb is now illuminating throughout all the cells in your body. You just envision that. And it's like almost mm -hmm. it's coming out of the side of your body, yes. and it's like you're this bulb of light, right? The same way you turned on your light is lighting up the room. And you feel, and what happens mm -hmm. is the entity, if it's a darker one, will detach because it doesn't feel comfortable with that light. And then from that point, you can ask it to leave. Just ask it to leave. Even if you don't have a communication, say, listen, I ask you to leave. Um, I thank you. First of all, before you do that, this is very instrumental, is thank it. I thank you for the services. I thank you mm -hmm. for the attachments. I thank you for everything that you've created in accentuating my polarity and all of that. And I thank you. And I know that you were coming from love and service. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, I no, no longer require your services because I got it now. I understand it. I, I am able to better navigate now. And I realize that I am not a victim, even though I did play the victim, victim role and you became as the victimizer because I, I, you know, I needed that, and I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So you start off with the thank you. Then from there, you say, okay, I, I choose no longer to, to require your services, and therefore, I don't need you to, to, to be here, not attached to me, or even in the space, because I am come here to raise the vibration of the space. Once you've done that, then you say, okay, I'm going to facilitate by illuminating this light. And so you illuminate that light within yourself. Just envision yourself. You close your eyes and just see this light expanding throughout the, first of all, through your body, then throughout mm -hmm. the room and then the rest of the rooms of the apartment or house or wherever you are. And, and allow them. And then with that light, it's almost like you're opening a path for them to be able to just leave the premises. Now, sometimes the entities will not want to leave. Uh, uh, I mean, release that but they won't stay in your space. Mm -hmm. They will go somewhere else. Okay. And other times they will use that to, to actually create enough light within themselves so that they can leave. That's as basic as you can do it. It's very simple. Okay. But like I said, if you're going in, you're afraid of them or you're going in with judgment. And this is the thing what happens. I've had practitioners that say, listen, I'm, I work on people and uh, then sometimes they attach to me or they won't leave my space. Mm -hmm. And I have mm -hmm. all these crystals and I have all these things, right? Mm -hmm. And my question to them is, are you afraid of them? Are you judging them? Are you looking at their polarized state and making that polarized state as something negative to you? Are you depending on crystals or other things to clear it for you or smudging or whatever? I mean, they, they, are, they do play a role. I'm not saying they don't. Mm -hmm. But if you really want your empowerment and your sovereignty, that you need to let go of that part. Because then you can walk and go wherever. They're not going to hang around. And they're going to be easy to clear, even if you're working on somebody. Like if I go in, for example, I had a student, which was one, my, my old partner from some time mm -hmm. ago, that wanted to learn how to do this because she felt that, oh, this is something I can do too. Mm -hmm. And she had some gifts because she was able to see certain things. Um, but when we were working on it, I had to keep reminding her, don't see that what we're clearing, even though sometimes they present not so attractive because she was able to see it, uh -huh. To judge it or to see it that you have to fight it or that you have, you're, the, you're, the, you know, you're the light and they're the dark. Don't see it that way because then you're going to have the fight. Duality. Yes. Duality comes in. Yes, and then the conflict of duality comes in, and that's not what you want to do. So at first, it was harder for her to be able to do it. Eventually, she got more comfortable with that, right? 
because sometimes when you're clearing them, especially if you can see them, they will come right up close to you. And if it stirs up any fear, then it's going to be harder to clear. So that's where you have to do work on yourself mm -hmm. to see them as another aspect of you, in a sense. Uh, and uh, it's there of service. And you say, hi, I'm here. How can I serve you? How can I assist you? Because you're no longer required in this particular individual. And how mm -hmm. can I you know, facilitate you or something of that nature. There are different things that you will learn. And, and the reason I'm sharing this is because a lot of people go in with the approach that they're the enemies, that's the dark stuff, and I'm Mr. Light and, or Mrs. Light or whoever, and I'm coming in to, you know, to clean. Yeah. Uh, yes, you are in a way, but you're not coming in with that polarized state. You come in of service and you're coming in as an equal too. And then you are much more powerful to be able to, to, to do that. Because even communication, for example, a lot of people say, well, how can I communicate with these entities or whatever that it's going mm -hmm. on? Yes. If we're going in as seeing them as negative or judgmental or anything of that nature, the communication is hard to establish, period. But if you see it as, okay, I see you there. Okay, let's communicate but you have no judgment about them and no fear about them, then you can communicate. No communicate with you. Because I found that it has a, that's how it works. Because I, that's from my own experience, but from mm -hmm. also from hearing from other experiences from people that have worked on it. Um, because if you're coming in with that, then uh, communication is not there, and a lot of times they'll play with you, and not in ways that you want to. So in essence, uh, the key for uh, spiritual uh, evolution is releasing fear. Yes. Once, once you release fear, you are able to, uh, to face and release all the negativities because you don't fear them. Correct. So, so in essence, uh, fear is our uh, biggest teacher. Yes, it's absolutely. The most, most powerful teacher. Correct. Correct. And then, because of that fear, being your teacher, you bring in other teachers along, and it can be animals, it can be um, uh, other, uh, other entities or humans, because in essence, it's all trying to help you to get to the maximum piece, uh, part of fear, and then dissolve it. The thing with, yes, the thing with fear, and uh, as a child, I was, uh, I was a, a small, skinny, and beaten kid, okay? and uh, I was always in fear. Mm. And and uh, I was a uh, uh, long distance runner because uh, I used to run away. Mm. So um, the the thing with fear, okay, um, is this is this is I think this uh, from 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 my view of life, fear is the essence of being. To live in 3D is yes. to deal with fear. Yes. To deal with fear and to release it. Correct. And I have many fears and I'm dealing with fears. And my fears today is these days fears are different from let's say uh, fears about 10 years ago when when the children were small and so forth and and uh, and health issues and so forth. And I see fear. Uh, as as levels of evolution of evolvement, okay. Yep. Some fears I know I am not ready to 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 cope to to deal with, and I know that I'm not ready and I'm not inviting them. them. But the other ones, let's say, uh, I know that I dealt with, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm more able. To let go of them and 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 cope with them, and I, I trust myself that okay, I can deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not it's not a trigger anymore. It's not driving right. anymore in my in my life. Correct. Right. So so the triggers that we seek in my life, the the, the, the most horrible uh, uh, fears in my life. Uh, I have fears of, of uh, losing control, mm. okay? And um, 
and fear of losing sovereignty. I'm, I'm very vigilant for my sovereignty. Mm. I'm very defiant in my nature. And I think also it's fear-based, but, uh, and I'm not ready to let go. Yes, the thing is, you, what helps you let go is to replace it with a higher understanding of that. For example, you know, the fear of losing your sovereignty and using your control or, or, or being in control. You need a program that convinces you. You need a program that tells you otherwise, that tells you, in fact, that you are not in control, everybody else is in control for you to hold on to the whole idea that I need to stay in control. Because in essence, once that's gone, the need to stay in control does not uh, become a factor anymore. It's not part of your, your experience. Because then at that point, you know that you're, you're, you're navigating your life, you're, you're creating your reality, you're doing all mm -hmm. of that. It, you're in charge of all of that. So you see all of that in that regard. So, that is not necessary. So in fact, you don't have to be village vigilant about you know, your sovereignty or control because first of all, the opportunities for being out of control is not there. Second of all, it's like not even unknowing. It goes even further than that. It's just, it doesn't even come into your recollection. It's just if somebody says to you, oh, I want you to do this. And instead you say, no, I don't want to do this. You say, no, actually that doesn't, doesn't resonate with me. Not interested. That's it. You don't even, it's so, like for example, I remember being, I, I, and I still have a little bit of it. I had an issue with people telling me what to do. Okay. As a child. Well, and, I, and I, I, I still live with a partner that tells me all about everything, always what to do. Yes. I'm following orders. <laughs> right. And, you know, so, that doesn't sit well with me. You know, it was never an issue because as far as I was concerned, if you're going to tell me what to do, it has to first resonate. Second of all, I, I have to see how I benefit from, from it in a sense. When I say not benefit, but it's actually sh helping me to see something that I need to share. And of course, everything is shared. But so in essence, with that whole idea of, uh, you know, um, how can I say it? Hmm. Sometimes the words don't come always the way I want to say it, but you know, the thoughts there, but the words don't come up, but okay. So somebody telling me what to do. I always felt in a sense, like a, ooh, like a, a resistance. It's like, and mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like, no, you dare tell me what to do. And I didn't reflect it that way, but I felt a part of me saying that. Right. And then I would go into your, your, part of what you said defiant so if they said to do this i do the opposite sort of thing yes. and that, and that's how i i was doing things before and then i start realizing sometime later i mean i did that for a long time start realizing is why does it bother me that i have to go into defiant and then it, the story came up the program came up that really i don't have control and everybody wants to tell me what to do because i don't have freedom of my own choice right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and I, I realized that that was just an illusion. It was like, no, that's just a story. That's a program. That's not real. So in essence, I had to start shifting that part of me to the point where when people say something and then something else came up and I, I, don't, I don't think we have enough time for all of that, but another thing came up. So one thing I started to realize is like, it's my choice if I want to participate, listen, or take that path at all. Really, I mean, I ultimately... I have the choice. And even when somebody would say, well, if you don't do this, you're not going to get this. And I'm going to go, well, so what? You know, I don't get that. Okay. I'm not going to do it. And I wouldn't mm -hmm. go defiant. I just choose not to say, well, no, it doesn't resonate. I'm not going to do that. Well, you're not going to get this. I, a lot of times, if it was something that I really wanted or part of my experience, I would get it anyways, maybe from another source, but whatever, it would still show up. It was never an issue. At first, that doesn't appear that way because at first you think, well, if I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to get this type of thing. And I'm not saying I'm 100% with that because I still have some of those tendencies to show up. Mm -hmm. But the other part that comes into the equation was 
asking the question is why do I feel that I have to do what other, I have to listen to what other people tell me to do. And the story came up, I like to be liked. I wanted to be accepted. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, there's the other equation of the program because that stimulates like if I do what they tell me to do, then first of all, they won't be angry at me. Second of all, they'll feel that I'm partner with them, but then they would like me more. They would love me more. They will accept me more. You know, all of those stories came up, right? Yes, absolutely. And then you have to address that part of it because that's a program too, you know? And uh, so I had to work on, on shifting uh, that part also. And then you find that this whole thing about control or whatever else, you, you, you're basically very conscious of your own navigation and you don't need to be, you know, in resistance or anything of that nature. And it flows and, and things will come. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't have any challenges because what happens, a challenge comes along of your own creation, co-creation with other aspects of yourself to just see other layers. Like, for example, what you were saying about the fears, right? You may not have the same fears as before, but other layers come in. That, first of all, you weren't ready. Now you're more ready for it. So you're going to have different things. And the same thing happens with me. I, I mean, there's levels of stuff that I never had to deal with before, or at least I dealt with it, but I didn't really have the same intensity as that I have now. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of get comfortable to the sense of, okay, you got to move every three years. Yes, you have no money and you whatever, you know, you have all these things. But you get neutral with that and you, none of it bothers you anymore. And then another level of equation comes in. It's like, okay, compromise health. And now deal with those things, even though they're the same, but now mm -hmm. you're doing it with a compromised health, for example. That's another part of the equation. So it goes into a deeper level of fear that now you get to experience and, get, and then have to address and clear that too. So it's amazing how all of that works. So and it's all our own creation, isn't it? Yes. So it's, it's something that our soul and entity is creating for us to experience. Correct, correct. And, and I, uh, I know some, uh, some people in my family who have, uh, 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 no, uh, uh, psychosomatics, psychosomatics illnesses, okay? And it's killed them. Mm. Absolutely, and um, it's 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 coming from from the from the emotions and negative emotions and whatever, and we 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 talked about entities. M maybe a sickness, let's say a long term sickness, may could be also an entity, isn't it? It has an entity of its own. Yeah, well, it, yeah, something of that nature, like illness, is a is a, is a, is. A, is is also an entity, yes. So if you refer, this is what, I, 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 I think you may have to go, right? Is that, am I correct? No, no. no? Oh, okay. No. Uh, they, they invited me for, for, for a dinner. I said, uh, uh, no, no later on. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't wanna hold you up, so. Okay. Um, say illness, if, if, let's take one example, because a lot of people can relate with this one. Say cancer. Cancer mm -hmm. is an entity. Because so many people have had it, there's this pocket of consciousness and uh, how it unfolds, okay? Mm -hmm. And how it actually uh, works. So if we get into the belief or we get caught up in the idea that we need to suffer or have something to compromise us, for example, if we're not comfortable with life or, or whatever, you know, I'm just giving you an example. And we were almost looking for a way out or uh, we want to get pity from people or we want to uh, escape from doing what everybody else is, is doing, then we will call upon or tap into the entity of an illness that will basically stop you from doing or lead you a direction that you feel that you can't do without its help. So when you tap into the cancer entity, it is a collective cancer entity that you can localize for your own specific requirement. And then it, what it does is alters the frequency and alters the pattern of how the cells operate and respond. Because now you're giving it new instructions, new frequencies, so mm -hmm. that it starts to develop. 
Now, if that activates fear, that fear can be used to create another shift within yourself or to you know accentuate it to a degree how can i say um to actually go deeper into that disempowered because look at this way we talk about having no control mm -hmm. okay a lot of times we look at we have no control because there is other people telling us what to do then there are systems and authorities that tell us what to do. Then there are different cultural stuff that tell us what to do. Religions. Mm -hmm. Then we get Family. into... I'm sorry? Family as well. Family, right? Yeah. So all of these are levels of we have no control because we're in this situation or we have all these inputs. The same thing applies when it comes to, um, I'm trying to find the right words for this. Hmm. Okay, let's take the medical system. Okay. You have an ailment and you go there and they're testing you out. It's all fear-based. But mm -hmm. then what happens is they say, okay, we diagnosed you with cancer. Now our frequency drops because they are basically playing the role for our frequency to drop because they just gave us news that the entity that we've taken on is actually, mm -hmm. oh, now we can go even further with this. And you're now creating a spiral of that now of course you're going to talk about it with your family and your family oh my god poor you this and that and you know and then there's more fear they're going to lose you or this is you know all their stuff and that becomes mm -hmm. much more and so you you're basically having all these combining entities and all these energies and you're creating a pool of that energy right right and it alters your reality who comes in who doesn't come in and so forth right uh, you, in, uh, even as playmates, right? They're all part and parcel of this whole s stream of things that have been activated within mm -hmm. that environment. I was going to lead into this uh, in a way. I'm just trying to find out how to do it. So it becomes very crucial at that point how we can shift all of that by looking at the fear of that news, that diagnostics or diagnosis, and all the, the, the people that are going to play that role. For example, mm -hmm. if you got a diagnosed with cancer, and many people experience that. I'm just giving you an example. Mm -hmm. Already you've activated this, but the doctor or practitioner, whoever, they're most likely going to play the role that you need the most, and that is to kind of create more fear. So they're mm -hmm. going to say, well, you know something? You need chemotherapy right away, or you need to go surgery right away, or you need to have radiation right away. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they're going to push fear, because if we don't grab it right away, you know, this is this is – you're not going to make it or something's going to get worse or you can't stop it or whatever it is. Now, say you choose to go with chemotherapy. You agree. Chemotherapy is another entity, a very dark entity with a very low energy frequency. Don't think that chemotherapy mm -hmm. is not an entity. And it's a very reinforced entity because Everyone that has a negative experience with chemotherapy, which people feel sick or feel that in one way or another that uh, it will kill you, because it does, mm -hmm. kills all the rest of yourself. That is all part and parcel of all the instructions. So when you take that on, you're not just taking on the entity of the cancer and fighting it or whatever it is. You're taking in mm -hmm. all of that. So it becomes very, in, very powerful in accentuating that experience within you it, to the degrees that it does. So it becomes very powerful where you need to, you know, uh, not fight it. This is one, one of the things I say to people is that you're not here to fight cancer, for example, because that's the belief system because that 
creates this whole entity around that because that's all identification to the fact that that's negative, that's horrible, and this is, you know, we have to fight it fire with fire. Because, we're, you know, when we're looking at it, the majority of people will fight the entity of cancer, for example, mm -hmm. with other negative fighting tools. And see it as an enemy makes it even much more powerful. Mm -hmm. But if you enter in it, say the doctor turns around and says to you, okay, you got cancer. I'm just going to give you the flip side. And you say, oh, okay, it's great to know that I have that, uh, that energy, that entity within me or so forth. Okay, great. And then you go home. And they're saying, oh, no, no, you got to get treatments. No, no, uh, let me reflect on this, whatever. You go home. They go, okay, cancer. Hmm. All right, I call you entity. Um, what are you here to teach me? What are you here to show me? What are you here to uh, facilitate you? I know I called you in. I know that we've chosen to participate and dance this together. Mm -hmm. um, what are we here to do together? Yeah, but uh, your, your, your elevated approach is, is with no fear. Most oh, yes. of humans, most of humans have the most prominent fear of death. Correct. If if you have the knowledge, it's more. As for myself, I know the uh, the existing of the soul and and um, say the infinite existence of souls, of soul. It's not a belief; it's a knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's way beyond of belief. Yeah. Most people don't have it. Correct. Right? So so it's um, that's why I see the. The first step for spiritual teaching is, is understanding that we are infinite. Release yes. the fear of death. Yes, yes. And that, that's the yeah. thing too. And there's an exercise that people can do. This is one exercise. Is if you have the fear of death, which most people do, um, because you know, the fear of death relates very, very much so. Because I, I mean, I was diagnosed diagnosed with some ailments that, that basically they said, oh, you don't stand a chance to die, right? I mean, to live, you're gonna die anyways, mm -hmm. very soon. Yes, we uh, all die. <laughs> yes. We, we are mortals, we, are, we should yes. die. <laughs> yeah, we just take an extension. <laughs> yes, because this thing that you have in you right now that's taken over your body is uh, going to bring you there really quickly within days mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. And in some cases, you would hear the opposite. You would hear differently, and they say, "Oh, yeah, you're already dead. You just haven't figured it out," sort of thing. <laughs> but you know, it was interesting because one of the practitioners that said to me and said, "Oh, listen, you are way beyond uh, recovery. Okay, you have you have less than ten percent chance that you're going to live sixty days." Okay. Mm -hmm. So all I said to her, I said, "Oh, no big deal." I've already been there. I know what's on the other side. I, I find it much easier if I did leave. No problem. And she looked at me and she goes, well, with that attitude, you'll probably make it for sure. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you're not engaging fear. You're not engaging that other part of it. So it's true what you said. Once you realize you break, break through or dissolve the fear of death, because that's ingrained in us. As a child, you don't come with that. Mm -hmm. right. It is programmed in you. Some of it comes from the lineage, yes, absolutely. But it still has to be activated. So what I say to people, and this is how I had to deal with it, and, I, and I've taught other people to do it, is for you to go into a meditative state and see yourself going to death, to the worst scenario you can create. You're gonna die. Mm -hmm. Okay, see yourself going through the death process in your mind's eye. Okay, mm -hmm. and when you actually follow through with it completely and see yourself, okay, you have no more physicality. You died. If you saw even it, sometimes the fear, the fear of suffering is way worse than dying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so see yourself suffering. See yourself that way. What happens? It takes a bit of practice. And I'm hoping to do a program that will help people do it together. So we can, I, you know, I would have an audio thing that they can listen that brings them into that state and so that they can face the fear of death. 
and and, and I would uh, guide them through it. Uh, I'm I, because that's been popular. I've helped with people to do that, but I want to do it so that people can, uh, without having a private session, be able to do it. But anyways, besides that, when you go into that, walk yourself through the deepest fear. So if it's a fear of suffering, see yourself in that worst state of suffering you can imagine in your mind's eye, and let those emotions mm -hmm. come up, those fears, whatever it is, and hold in, hold the fears, build it up as much as you can. Because what happens, duty? for mm -hmm. people is if you do it effectively by just staying tracking instead of backing off you will notice that it will get stronger and stronger and stronger but then after a while it starts to re reverse because it starts to fade away you can't sustain it it becomes very difficult to sustain so it starts to break down and at a point a certain level of peace starts to come in through you well and you mm -hmm. And you will find it more difficult to actually create the fear or activate the fear after a while, okay? And sometimes you have to do it more than once. You know, uh, you know, you have to do it, but each time you chip away at it, mm -hmm. you will find that once you've got to the point where the fear is no longer there, there's a sense, such a powerful peace that you get to a point where you're okay here, being here or not being here. So the fear of death dissolves. Mm -hmm. And you will notice that a lot, once that fear is done, the fear of certain things that you would want to do, but you're so afraid to do. Like, for example, somebody wants to skydive, you know, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. What's the scariest part? That the thing is not going to work and you're going to hit the ground and you're going to die, right? When you take that fear away, of, not of skydiving, but of fear of death, all of a sudden that may or may not resonate for you. You're not going to have issues with it. It's like, okay, I got a job. A knowing, a knowing comes up that you're really actually in control. And you can decide if you're going to check out or not from, from that experience, but there's not going to be any fear. That's just one example I'm just giving you. Okay. As for um, anecdote for skydiving, my fear about skydiving is is actually the the emotion, the feeling of falling. Mm. It's not the crash, it's not the jump. It's the it's the essence of falling, of of traveling with no no bottom. Yes. Now, yeah. what if you actually tune into that? What's the fear that activates with with that jumping? I, I believe I believe it's something to do from early, early uh, for another lifetime, but uh, of of kind of falling from from a cliff or something like that. But it's actually it's the feeling of the fall. Okay, so if you do the exercise where you envision yourself falling, jumping out of a plane mm -hmm. and falling, see what comes up for you as the fear ask your, you can ask yourself ahead of time i'd like to understand what is triggered in me when i'm falling because a lot of times you'll find the program will come up and for, for some people what i found is the fear of loss of control that mm -hmm. is is um covered up you can't really see it but the fact is i'm falling i can't navigate uh or i can't control what happens you know, oh, yeah. story, uh, because like you said, from a past life or some other situation, or sometimes it's a lineage from somebody else's past mm -hmm. life, um, from family, uh, that that led to possibly death or that led to suffering or something of that nature when you lose that control. Because that's huge. This loss of control uh, relates to everything, uh, to many things, actually. For example, I have that one too. Uh, it's getting better. It's not 100% either. Mm -hmm. uh, even the example is, like for my example, not having any money. Okay? Uh, logically, scarcity. logically, it's, yes. This, you know, it's the scarcity thing, but logically mm -hmm. it's like, so what? Don't have any money. But then you want to ask, Okay, but why is so fearful? What is so um, challenging with having no money? 
and the thing that came up for me personally, and this relates with many people, was that, oh, I lose the full control. I will not have in charge of what I eat, where I stay, what I get done or don't do, mm -hmm. or any of that nature. There was a fear of now other people will dictate, and it's just a story, a program, mm -hmm. other people will dictate what I do. It's like going back to your childhood and it's like feeling the memory of, oh, I have no say. Mom and dad tell me what I eat, when I eat, how mm -hmm. I eat, whatever I do. Uh, mom and dad tells me what I have or don't have. Uh, mom and dad tells me what I can or cannot do. You know, mm -hmm. and it, it related to that. It's like, because when we're growing up, we go, oh, great. I want to go to school, get a, get, get a good job so that I can go out and do what I want to do. I don't want to be under the realm of my parents. I don't want to be in the realm of anybody else. And this is what, why people do it. The, the, the working and, and doing, taking on jobs and stuff is the fear of con lack of control because if this, the way the system teaches you how we're taught is that if you have money, you have control. And the more money you have, you have more control. That's kind of mm -hmm. the system taught, what you're taught. Yeah. So now I can live wherever I want. I can travel anytime I want. I can do whatever I want. I can even buy people if I want. When I say buy, mm -hmm. buy, you know, yeah. services or whatever, right? Um, I can do lots of things. And I can actually, the, the next level was, the more money I have, more power I have over other people. More control I have over other people. And I can tell people to do whatever I want them to do. You know, so those are the, the conditioned program uh, stories, right? Mm -hmm. So... Not that I had that level where I wanted to control people because that's the last thing I want to do is, you know, uh, have that part. But the one thing that came up for me the strongest is that I lose control. I lose control of my own life, of where I go, what I do, don't do, whatever. And that was the part that was coming up in the fear component because it was interesting. It's like loss of control because even the knowing part, and this is the interesting part, the knowing has to become your reality, you has to live it, because knowing that you're in control and you create your reality is the first step, and it's a powerful step. But then you have to exercise it. You have to start using it. And you start shaping your life around that. You go beyond the belief. You become experientially active with that knowing. So you start putting it into your reality. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I really relate to that because I wasn't unemployed for uh, uh, 16 months, and we have we were uh, we were assisted by family and supported by family. And to me, it was very very difficult lesson to be assisted. Mm -hmm. I was very humbled and very grateful, but it, and it was a very very difficult lesson for me to be assisted, not yes. to be to be dependent. Correct. Yes. I I didn't see it as a system. I see it as being dependent, mm. and I was not requested. I I was not uh, re required to let's say to pay services, but I felt like I'm dependent. Right. So I I really relate to that. Um, uh, I also would like to uh, uh, relate to the fear, which is very d deeply ingrained in me. Is fear of pain, and suffering. Mm. I believe I released the fear of, of dying with my knowledge of, of reincarnation and, and, uh, and the soul existence, but I still uh, have deep fear of, of pain and suffering. Mm. Yes. And, and, and that uh, on belief of, of uh, let's say, on sit from suffering in situational place, places and also suffering in from uh, sickness and 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 uh, uh, and health issues, right? And this is, uh, I would say, uh, a major demon in my life. Mm. Uh, it's not cancer. I, I, as a child, I was terrified from cancer, but since my mom died from cancer, I was 27, I believe, uh, and she she was dying for six months. She, it was a terrible experience. Mm. I no longer fear cancer, but I have still uh, still a, a fear of, of, of suffering and, and being uh, let's say immobilized and losing and, and losing func uh, functionality of the body and so forth. Yep, I can 
and oh, growing yeah, and, grow, and growing old. And uh, my, my stepmother, uh, she was uh, paralyzed for almost three years and she was uh, in full conscious and, and she, she, so it's terrible. It's, uh, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to create it, so I won't, uh, I, I won't uh, elaborate on that, but this is a kind of a big issue for me, mm -hmm. is, is, is dealing with, with, uh, with suffering in general and, and pain in general. Right. So I, I, I wouldn't like to delve in it because I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I would like to, to discuss uh, uh, what you uh, said if about... If you want, I mean, I can play with it on a general cases without rather... Uh, it's... Um, I'm not ready for this. Okay. 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 Uh, yet, uh, maybe another discussion or maybe. Uh, um, okay. Uh, in 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 previous uh, when we discussed the entities, uh, you said about um, uh, you mentioned about interacting and discussing with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Speaking with them. So and this uh, uh, when you when you said that uh, I was. Uh, because I'm thinking, okay, we need to, uh, as, as we evolve and, uh, and experience more than just the physicality, we need uh, uh, to, uh, to evolve and strengthen our discern uh, muscle. Mm -hmm. or whether is this, is this my thought? Is this the soul? Is this the entity? Is this a possession? So, I would like to see to to uh, to uh, to uh, to ask you what's how, how do you de develop your own discern about who is talking now, <laughs> whose thought is this, okay, okay. who's who's thinking now? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. So that, that's a good point because uh, a lot of a lot of people, you know, have the same uh, thing. It's like, how do I know who's talking? You know, is it my entity? Is it my my mind? Is it uh, another entity? Is it something channeling through me? Is it my soul, or anything of that nature? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an excellent point because a lot of times it can be, you know, unless you um, are able to uh, discern. Um, you kind of almost don't know on a logical uh, way. Now, depending on what you want to listen to, you direct it. So if you're going to want to talk to your ego mind, okay, for example, you're going to say, okay, I am having this communication with my ego mind, and mm -hmm. all other parts of me, you're not welcome to the discussion at this point. Okay. Now, when you're having the conversation, then you say, okay, ego mind, you keep spewing out all these ideas or whatever it is. What is your agenda? What's your purpose? What do you want to see from this? You know, and you have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And you stay focused because sometimes you'll find that it comes from a different viewpoint or whatever it is. And say, okay, is this you? Like, for example, you get a thought, and somehow it doesn't feel like, okay, is that really coming from my? They say, ego mind, is it you that's sharing this, or not? And it will. Now, sometimes you hear two voices, or hear two thought streams, or feel, or have two thought streams. Okay, which one of you? You know. So you can have that. You you get you get more used to where it's coming from once you practice that for a while. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. But the key part that the so that's that you can talk to the entity. You can talk to your body, too. Uh, people muscle test. That's really communication with the body. Now the reason people muscle test is because they don't want their ego mind to jump in, right? Uh, but doesn't mean that's one hundred percent evil. So you have a conversation with the body. You say, okay, you don't mind, you step out. You're not talking, you're going to have the body. So you say, body, how can I serve you? What, what part of this experience that I can assist you with? Or what are you trying to tell me about this situation or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. For example, you have 
somebody has cancer in their body. So you have a conversation with the body, okay? You can have a conversation with your higher self too about it, but have separate ones. Now, okay. what I recommend to people. Um, you spread the, the discussion to many entities, okay? Yes. Um, the point of discernment is identifying them, right? Right. They, right. How do you know, okay, am I speaking now with the soul? Is it soul, really? Oh, maybe you are the ego that's uh, pretending to be a soul. Right, 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 uh, right. Right? Or let's say I'm channeling. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. channeling something. Well, is it really something else out of time myself? Maybe it's my, my soul. Maybe it's a, a previous life side. A, a, um, lifetime is speaking now, entity from life. So how do you discern and tell, okay, I know this is the soul. I know this is the, the body. I know this is the uh, previous lifetime and so forth. That takes practice. Um, the, the reason that I say that is because you have to be the observer at this point in time, right? So whenever information is coming through you, to you, whatever it is, you kind of tap into the source of it. You have to kind of feel where it's coming from, okay? Like for example, if it's the ego mind, it's very polarized, very fear-based, it's very emotional driven, it's all of that. You feel all different levels. Entities will share information, for example, if you're channeling uh, information that actually has sometimes polarization, sometimes it may not resonate with what's going on on a bigger perspective. Mm -hmm. When you're getting your soul communicating, and the reason I say here is because that's the, 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 um, the heart chakra is where the soul communicates through. Um, in essence, what happens in that regards is that when you're tuning into that, it's very calming. It's very, uh, when your soul's talking, it doesn't talk in polarization. It does not create and stimulate emotional charges, being mm -hmm. positive, negative, whatever it is. It's very calm. Because a lot of times people ask the question is like, I'm, a I'm asking for help from my higher self, and, but I have all this dialogue sort of thing going on in my head. Mm -hmm. How do I know? So I say, okay, just focus on the heart. So focus there, just okay, and communicate. And the answer that you're going to get that's very calm, very clear, is coming from your soul. If it's and, coming and, with polarity. And the first one. It's yes, the first the one. one. Yes. The, second, the second and the rest, are, I would say, uh, contaminations from the ego and from the mind. Correct. Because what happens is the soul will give you one, like you ask the soul, this is the way the soul works. So you ask the question, um, I'd like to understand what's going on here. And it says, well, you're reacting from a program. It might say just that. Very calmly, mm -hmm. very clear. Ego mind comes in and says, what program? Remember what happened here and remember what happened there. And you mm -hmm. look at the situation and so forth. And it's going to give you a whole bunch of other things normally. And a lot of it sometimes contradicts each other itself or it does all types of, of things. And it's mm -hmm. emotionally charged. That's one way, one powerful way you can actually discern where it's coming from. Because the soul does not give you all of that at all. Okay. The other thing is too, sometimes people are channeling. And when we're talking about channeling, you have to use your own discernment. That means you don't run it into your logical mind. You run it into your heart, what resonates, what doesn't resonate. Because you're going to get information that may not resonate because it's not applicable. Or it may be stimulating. Because don't think channeling is the ultimate. This is one of the, thing, one of the things I've, I've said. Exactly. I've said to people, just be, you know, let's put it this way. I, I'm just making it clear, okay? Mm -hmm. Some people get all excited that they're channeling. I'm not, personally, I'm not supportive by any means of, of channeling. Okay. okay. But, Many but people feel special, feel something better because they're getting a channel from something. And that's when they take their discernment and throw it out the window for a while. And they take whatever information is coming in. 
you know, that's an experience anyways. But at the same time, what happens is that if you're not using your own discernment, the information may not be applicable. The information may be skewed because what are you channeling? Unless you become really skilled in recognizing what you're channeling and communicate for, beforehand what its motives are, mm -hmm. you can get anything and you can get other, other entities that will be, impo in, what do they call it, imposter? Imposter, mm -hmm. yeah. Become as an imposter saying, oh, I am such and such, right? And they will relate to information. So this is where you have to connect with yourself and see how much it resonates because you can get any types of information, especially if you create a reliance for something outside of you to come in to direct your life, you now open the floodgates for anything and everything. That's dependency. Correct, correct, okay? Mm -hmm. I've had people that created a profession around channeling. And what happens is a dependency relies to it. At first, that may work out. At some point later on, what happens is the, the entity that they're channeling may not want to participate because of its reliance on it mm -hmm. and all that stuff and start saying, okay, you're depending on me. This is not serving on a grander scale. Mm -hmm. So it may refrain from communicating with you, but you're still, oh, look, I created a following and I have to channel and I have to do this because this is what people are expecting. And now you're forcing the channeling to come through and now you're opening the gate for another entity to come in mm -hmm. to say, oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to communicate. And then you will get bits and pieces of what is more in alignment, but the rest of it may not, or a lot of it may not. And that's where the discernment has to come in. And, but you, the first part of it is like what you said, you don't wanna have dependency on that, reliance or dependency on any, uh, anything outside of you, or see yourself that you're less than what comes through you outside of you, okay? Because then you're really opening up. And now the lesson in behind of that is to, to realize that if you open yourself in dependency, this is where you're going to uh, get caught in to, to um, that little trap, if you want to call it that, is that part of that experience. So my point is how you go in with the communication. You're wanting to know. You want to know from a higher perspective of yourself, but the highest perspective that you are ready to receive at this time. You make that very clear. And now you, when you hear what's coming in, you always run it by your higher self, your soul. Okay, you run it by that. You don't analyze it and make it logical because that part will come in too. But you go in, how does it feel? How does this information feel? And if it doesn't resonate, then go on and ask more questions. Direct that communication, whatever's coming through you, so that it does start to, to, to resonate. There's a whole other level of resonation that we would have to talk about, but I don't know if we have time for that, so we won't go there. Maybe in another conversation at another time. Okay. But So that's how you do it. it, and it really depends on how you're coming in. You're coming in with fear, you're looking for a solution outside of yourself, that's okay. You could ask for a solution outside of yourself because I do that too. But the way I approach it is very different. I'm not looking for the, the answer, answer. I look for, can you give me another, I'm asking for a different perspective of one that I cannot see while my mind is engaged or one that I cannot see from my somewhat limited perspective from my human experience at the moment with my, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then take the perspective that is shared and see how it aligns and then work with that. So take it as a tool, take it as constructive material rather than the answer. Okay. I learned mm -hmm. that um, mm, problems are not solved. Th problems are replaced. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, 
on a technical level and on a personal level. And um, I also uh, many times request assistance from higher planes. And I learn after a while that I don't, the way I, I request is, I request assistance in uh, solving the issue or the problem, not really assisting me to solve it. Mm -hmm. okay. Many times I'm I, I'm in a in a in a imaginary uh, responsibility. I have to solve this. I have to fix it. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes the problem or, or the issue, the challenge we are facing, it's not really related to me, and it can go away without me. Okay. If it's a client, uh, things can happen without me, uh, my, so forth, with the family and so forth. So I learned to request assistance on solving the issue or the challenge and not requesting that I will solve it. Mm -hmm. It's relinquished responsibility. Right, yes. Good, excellent. But uh, uh, back to, uh, to the thing about discernment, I learned one that I learned how to uh, uh, identify, let's say, lower plane uh, polarized uh, knowledge, which is divisive, which is controlling, which is fear based. And uh, uh, when I say divisive, it means that uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, distinguish myself or the group as special, even if it's in a, looking at this, the group, let's say the Jews, the Jews are the chosen one, mm -hmm. or, 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 or my team are, let's say, the talented team, or the leading team of, of the company and so forth. Whenever there's kind of distinguish, distinguish, distinguishment, is that correct to say? Yeah. Distinguishment, okay. It's not coming from, from the, uh, positive side, it's coming from the negative side of separation. Yes. Okay. Yes. And people fall it, into it once and again because they are flattered. Yeah. Okay? Yes. You yes. are special, you are this, you are that, you have capabilities, you have skill and so forth. But this is again uh, divisive, divide and conquer. Correct. Yes. Okay? And another, another trick is uh, coming from uh, that I learned how to uh, identify, uh, let's say the negative part is bringing external authority. Mm. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. This, this, one, this is an expert from out of the country. He must be more knowledgeable than, than, than our own local experts. Okay. This is kind of the technical point. Okay. Yeah. This is, an alien from a different galaxy, or he must be much more knowledgeable and much more it is, spiritual than we are. Okay, this is another trick, known trick. Yep. Yep. Okay, so it takes knowledge and self-reflection. What is the source? Okay, and what is, I would say, the agenda that it comes with? Correct. And uh, I also uh, uh, noticed that, let's say, some professional uh, professional channelers, the I would say uh, the personality of the entities has changed, evolved. Yes. During the years, and I will not name name uh, the the uh, the channelers and, and the entities. So. I wouldn't say that I have full discernment of, I can identify, well, this is the ego, this is the, the um, a, a previous lifetime or, or entity, or this is my, my higher self. But I, many times I can, I can feel the essence and, and the answer to my question, the first, um, the first sense, the most correct. Right, correct. Okay. 
And, and sometimes I can feel that the first sense is fear-based. And, and I accept it. Well, this is the ego, this is the mind, this is the body. And it's acceptable. And, I, and there's no, because I'm in the fear-based, there's no uh, place ready for a higher place, high, higher knowledge to come in. And only when I'm ready to release the fear or release it, a higher level of knowledge will come and I'm ready to accept. Mm -hmm. But that's for myself. Other people have developed their own mechanisms to discern. Correct. But I believe that this is a very important, uh, let's say, um, skill required in order uh, to evolve spiritually. Is this sermon? Yep, absolutely. One other thing I can I can throw in there: um, your higher self will never tell you what to do. Will guide you, but it'll never tell you what to do. Don't do this. Do this. Or it'll never get that. Just okay, but and, and it's also very playful. Yes. My my own, my, my, my my higher self. It's playful. So, okay. Yes. Let's try this. Let's try this. Okay. We didn't try this one. You know, mm -hmm. you, 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 uh, you put it on the shelf. Maybe you want to try that and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, and, and another uh, uh, trick, it's a good trick, is to uh, request for uh, specific signs. Mm -hmm. What I mean, sign, let's say, Okay, if this is the correct, show me, uh, let's say, uh, a white feather. Show me, or, or um, I, I want, I, I give me a sign for, let's say, um, a special shape of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of a leaf, or some kind of uh, combination of numbers, or, or a phrase, and so forth. Be specific with, with asking your higher self for, for a sign. And if it is correct, you will receive it. And sometime I request for a sign and it took about three, a few months for the sign to arrive. Hmm. So do you see that as something beneficial or you see that as a trick? I see that as a trick, as a trick to get a communication with my higher self. Yes, exactly. Okay. So people who don't have... Uh, the discernment of identifying what is the, and they want to, to ask, uh, let's say, uh, a, a, a true false the question, they can ask for a sign. Mm -hmm. okay. If this and this and this, please give me a sign that, ta 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 ta. Right. So this is a, it is a trick. Uh, when you are more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, connected, uh, you have a kind of a language talk. Mm -hmm. So you find that beneficial or distracting? Yes, I find it beneficial, but you can, it can be also uh, addictive. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then you get when, reliance, and now you're yes. going to. When, um, when I was young, but my teenagers, teenage time, before I got uh, conscripted to the army, I was extremely uh, uh, proficient with uh, a, a card divinity. Hmm. I was able, if something was lost, I was able to use the cards, cards reading, yep. to find to find it, and to to identify what th people think of of me and and what they want and so forth. And there was come a point I thought I must stop. Taking over me, mm -hmm. and I stopped. And I realized, well, at some point, it's taking over uh, my my. Uh, and I was young; I was seventeen or eighteen. It is taking over my my uh, my uh, 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 sovereignty. Mm. Yeah, I'm not taking a decision anymore. That's right. That's right. Right. So I stopped. And he said, I'm not doing anything more. Because uh, I learned the power. I, I recognize how powerful it is. I experienced it. And I learned that I don't need it. Mm. 
Perfect. But sometimes I do, uh, when I get, uh, let's say, distressed, I request other people to, to assist me with, uh, with divinity and things like that. Yeah, because sometimes we get so uh, caught up in our mind and our emotions and so forth that uh, it becomes a little bit skewed. So in essence, mm -hmm. somebody that's not involved with the situation or something like that will give you something that you know, is a little clearer only because it's your, your aspect of yourself talking to them to, to show you what you need to, to look at or see or, or information that you require. Because at that, moment, that point, you're so engaged in the mind that it won't, um, it won't be as clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that would be yeah. rare occasions. But, you know, again, you can create a little reliance and dependency and having somebody be your card reader all the time or something, you know. Yeah. So uh, I've, I've seen it with people too. Say, well, I can't make a decision. I have to go see my astrologist, or I got to go see my, uh, you know, uh, card reader. I have to, I have to uh, talk to somebody else first before they can make a decision. Mm -hmm. And that that's total disempowerment there. Mm -hmm. So I uh, uh, and, and that, another uh, I call it trick because uh, it's 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 a tool. It's a tool that can assist you and uh, should not be uh, relied on for a long run. Uh, uh, looking at uh, a sequence of numbers. Mm, yes. Okay. And people who, uh, who learn uh, numerology also can use those kind of sequence. Could be a, a, a pairs of sequence or, uh, or say, same, same digit many times. Mm -hmm. In in in, num in phone numbers, in in license plates, in uh, um, uh, street advertisement, and so forth. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is another kind of trick of communicating with your higher self or with the cosmos. You're right. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, but. It's, it, it's not a relief from the required discernment. Hmm. Sometimes I get a sign and I say, well, this is not a sign. I, uh, I request, I request a, a, a replication. And if you get a replication three times, they're definitely a sign, mm -hmm. okay? a, a kind of a, a concrete sign. Right. And if it's the same same day, okay, it's very <laughs> concrete. It kind of it's like almost a threat. Right, you have right. to, to to accept it. Yeah. But but in order to uh, to uh, recognize and and uh, be responsive, you have to be very, I would say, uh, discerning and perceptive to the signs. Mm -hmm. um, I know a story of, of, uh, of a native Indian shaman who used to do divinity. He asked his, uh, his clients, go on a specific uh, trail for a few minutes and, and tell me all the, uh, the life creatures that you Tell me all the life creatures that you, that you met during the, um, the walk, during, during the, the, the hike, uh, the, and what they did. Mm. Birds, insects, animals, whatever you, you meet, tell me how you say it and what they did. And I sometimes when I see uh, 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 rare animals in my path, uh, I greet them as... as, as uh, as a sign, sign bringers, kind of, of entities who bring signs. Oh, right, right, okay, okay. okay. So this is, I, I, I honor them for bringing something or some clue or something like that. Yeah. In, in one of my, uh, my uh, nightly walks, I saw two boars, kind of uh, wild bears, wild yeah. pigs, boars. Right, right, yeah. Uh, porcupine. Uh, a, a badger and a fox. One trip, <laughs> one hour. <laughs> so that that's most definitely a sign. <laughs> so did you uh, 
see what this what the message was for you no 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 but i know it was it was a sign or maybe they were they were fleeing it was coming from a hill so my day they were all fleeing from that hill <laughs> <laughs> all right so so um what's 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 your um what's your point on uh, uh, about the divinity and and signs um no respect yeah so the thing is when we are learning from uh, from self trust then we may want to ask for signs from our higher self to kind of uh, appease the mind uh, and also to have something a little bit more confirming and concrete mm -hmm. uh, that works to a certain degree because a lot of times our minds will discount it like you said okay no I have to see it in three signs and it has to be in this way or that way or whatever it is because uh, the mind the ego mind would like to, to, to do that so it's a good a good starting point um, but again like you said uh, we're, it's not that there to put it on reliance because uh, then it starts to interfere. Uh, what I found is that uh, you can start, it's like learning how to walk. You can start doing that at first until mm -hmm. you get a little bit more comfortable. But then, you know, you connect with yourself and get the input from yourself uh, to, to navigate. But the thing is, even with the signs and whatever else, we are ultimately the one that makes the decision and then you may want to see if there was something that you are not seeing like you were pointing out earlier that needs to come into the equation okay for for that decision like for example um it's, you're not going to go to your higher self and say should i go on a trip or not you know uh because the higher self, you know, unless it has something very specific to say to you, it says, yeah, it's a good idea to go on the trip. But in essence, I'm feeling like I need a trip. And I'm feeling that maybe with this trip, I'll have some downtime so that I can actually reflect on some things that I, I'm having a challenge with. Would this be conducive at this time, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And you may get yes, no, whatever, you know, comes into your mind. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you come to say, well, do you really need that to get, you know, to go away somewhere to clear your mind? Or do you need to start looking at some of the things that you're mm -hmm. dealing with? And you can do that anywhere. You know, you'll, you'll have whatever guidance you want. The, the thing is, you don't want to get into that state where you're, you're wanting your higher self to uh, be telling you what to do because you're never going to learn. Because this, this experience is not just what the soul wants per se because part of what the soul wants is for your own self you know to align mind body and soul to work together with the entity and everything else and how well are you going to do that when you're just focusing on only your higher self and saying well give me the answers because you're not learning how to condition your mind to align and to get the information to use its own creativity rather than just give me the answer, give me the answer, give me the answer type of thing. And uh, like, I don't know if I should go out on a date with this person. Uh, is it the right thing to do? You know, you don't want to go into that because then you're in dependency. Now you're into reliance. You're now into self disempowerment because you're not bringing any other parts. Because the thing is, your higher self is going to say, well, how do you feel about it? Yeah, but, but I had some occasion in my life mm -hmm. that I was prevented to going to places. Yes, 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 and that's that's the, the the thing is because it's not an experience that you need. Maybe the mind is turning around and saying, "Well, you know, it'd be great to go and do this," but it could be a distraction. It could be something that'll throw you off the path. So, in that point in point in time, your your higher self is going to say, "Well, it's not a, a conducive right now to go and do that because it'll be a distraction or this or that, or just not to go there." Period. And because it's not part of your experience, because whatever is being uh, taking place there is for whoever's going to participate, and you're not really in alignment with that participation. And that's a good point because that that has come uh, with myself too, where you know uh, everybody's saying, "Oh, we're all going over here. We're going to have so much fun, whatever it is." 
part of me might say, yeah, you know, I haven't had much, you know, fun on the physical plane uh, for a while. But then mm -hmm. uh, your your higher self says, no, that that's not for you. And and that's okay because it's not part of an experience that you need to have because there's already an agreement of something that's going to take place there that is not really something that you need to participate mm -hmm. in. And that's it. So you follow you follow that guidance. But it's not going to tell you every step of the way what to do and not to do because that's not what it's there to do. Okay, so let for, for following this this thought, so where where is the uh, what is the essence of guides? Okay, if it's not going to tell you what to do, okay. if well, if I I call, I call assistant for my guides, okay, mm -hmm. what is the assistant for not telling, uh, guiding me or or showing me uh, the lesson or, or or the path? Yes, the the guides are there to show you uh, the. The, the the a potential path it's show it's uh, showing you what to learn from it what to observe but it's not going to say well if you do this this is right and if you do that that's something wrong because then that will happen in a few occasions but in essence that's the same thing so when you're asking for a guide's assistance you say okay uh, right now I'm you know I'd like some assistance in seeing a different perspective or uh, can you show me a potential outcome if I go down this path um, you can ask for uh, is there what am I missing I'm not no, I'm not noticing because I'm so caught up in my mind or something of that nature and, and they're very good for for that part of it but even the guides I mean the guides are not there to interfere because even the angelic realm the guides they're they used to be more participant before where they uh, kind of led you more, but now they don't, they're not, they've been instructed for some time now uh, on a collective scale, not to instruct, mm -hmm. giving you direct answer, answers to what you should do or shouldn't do. It will give you um, some awareness of if you do this, these are some of the potentialities. If you do that, these are some of the potentialities right now, really what do you want to do? What, Part of an experience you want and then you still ultimately make the decision but you know like the example that you you um, you said about you know not to go into this building for example or not to go someplace then if there's if that's more that's important to tell you that right away without you noticing uh, going through the, the the exercise of figuring it out yourself, which is giving you some information, then it will give you some direct. That's not all the time. That's occasionally. Um, other times you'll say, "Jump, go do it, go do it," right? And uh, and when you do it, then of course you're going to have certain experiences that you may learn or expand or you know be more in alignment for for you. Um, one of the things that people were creating was a dependency and reliance. Now, there's more to that because if, if it doesn't really matter, if the priority at this point in time is not for you to advance in this lifetime, but just to play mm -hmm. a specific role, then you'll find that you'll get more assistance uh, in that regards because it's not so concerned about, you know, disempowerment part of it. However, if you're on the fast track where you want to do, become empowered and become a powerful tool for the human experience and its transformation, then uh, using every aspect of you, your body, your mind, then an entity communication with your higher self is necessary, then anything they guide you is like, okay, remember what your soul has been telling you or remember this other perspective or whatever it is. It may help you see that, but you're ultimately going to decide what, what you're going to do. What about uh, uh, communication uh, with uh, uh, non-terrestrials, or let's say uh, inter-terrestrials? Same, and same thing. It's very, very similar. There, uh, you know, unless you know, there you you're bringing in a situation where you're in. Um, uh, what can I call it? Not survival, but if there's another word I'm thinking. But if you're going in and, and uh, wanting them to give you the answer on how to, to do things and so forth, then, uh, you know, unless you're going to learn from that experience and they're going to push you to, to that, that's fine. But in essence, 
there's two things about extraterrestrials and also with angelic realms and also with guides. They're not mm -hmm. living your life. Okay. They're not uh, responsible. Yeah. I, I bring it back to a sporting game. I'm not a sports person, but I can mm -hmm. see how that works. When you are playing, say, soccer or football or whatever, mm -hmm. you are present of where you are. That means you're playing the game. You're running up the field. You're kicking the ball or you're doing whatever you're doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're aware of your skills. You're aware of the field that you are. You're aware of how you feel, how much more energy your body has and so forth. But then you may want a, a broader perspective and you may not be able to see who's getting ready to come in into your path. Mm. So yes. your guides, your angelic realm, your ETs, whatever you want to call it that you tap into are the ones in the stand. They're the ones that are the audience in a way. Okay. Now they have a little radio connected to you and they say, okay, listen, there are certain things coming. They're not going to tell you, kick the ball now or do whatever you have to do. They're going to say, listen, you have some coming your way. Use your skills to navigate around that. Just be, you know, and they'll give you a perspective of seeing a bigger field, seeing the whole field rather than just seeing your spot on the field, you know, type of thing. But at the same time, they're not going to know how much energy you have left. If you can actually run that far, or that if you're ready to be tackled or be able to have an opponent come your direction a certain way, that mm -hmm. you will know. So it would say, this is what's coming to you and this is what to prepare yourself for. You decide what action you're going to take because you know how, because you're on the field and you're in the body. That's just an analogy to give you that. Mm -hmm. And even in your navigational experience. Okay. How are we with time? Uh, we're, we're about 13 minutes over. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, do you think it's a good time to, uh, to, uh, conclude now? Yes, I think so. I mean, we can go on for a long time. Uh, Dudy, yes, and, me too. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so uh, kind of vibrant and <laughs> I enjoy it a lot. Yes. Maybe you can see it my, in my energy. <laughs> yes, no, I, and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying your enjoyment and I'm enjoying the fact of having this type of communication with you. And you hold Thank a good you. energy and space to all of it. So. Thank you. I'm sure the people uh, that are going to listen to this will, uh, will view it, will, uh, will highly benefit from it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm flattered. And um, so let's conclude uh, the recording now. Uh, I'm very grateful for, for this talk. I'm looking forward to the next uh, discussion, interview. Um, my uh, my, my uh, mind is running high now with uh, different co all, all different questions and, and I will have to uh, digest, my mind will have to digest this, uh, this discussion. And uh, let's uh, uh, spare some, some more uh, discussion to the next uh, interview. Until uh, sure. next time, thank you. And uh, talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me on uh, and for uh, asking the, 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 the amazing <laughs> questions and, and also everything that you shared. So this was a dance that we did together. So thank, thank you. you.